Hello. I would like to call this meeting to order. Will you all please rise and join in the Pledge of Allegiance? Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Reed. Here. Vice Mayor Litt. Here. Council Member Woods. Here, ma'am. Council Member Marciano. Here. Council Member Tinsley. Present. Are there any additions, deletions, or modifications this evening? No, ma'am. Thank you. Next, we have announcements and presentations. First, we have Palm Beach North Resilience Action Plan. Well, Noel Martinez, President and CEO of the Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce. Please come to the podium. Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Mayor. For the record, my name is uh, Noel Martinez. I am President and CEO of the Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce. And with me today, I have Mr. Chip Armstrong, longtime chamber member, former board member and chair of our development, uh, Economic Development Committee. And of course, Kathleen Joy, who a lot of you know, she's our Director of Community Engagement at the Chamber and, and does a lot of amazing stuff for us. So first, I want to start off by saying thank you. Um, the City of Palm Beach Gardens, and I, and I say this every time I get in front of you, is such an amazing partner to the Chamber. Um, everything, whether it's hosting Artie Raw or working on us with all kinds of different initiatives, we are so proud of this municipality and the work and, and how great it is to the business community. So thank you so much for all of your support. So disaster resiliency is something that has been on the Chamber's radar for many, many years, right? Let's face it, it's only a matter of time before we have a Cat 5 storm that's going to come right down PGA Boulevard. And we want to make sure that we are ready and we are ready for it, and we're ready to open as fast as possible after it. It's so important that we could fill our prescriptions at the pharmacy, fill our cars with gas at gas stations, and have access to food at the grocery store. The actions um, to follow this disaster resiliency plan that we're gonna talk to you about is gonna ensure that our neighborhood businesses have generators and our communities are equipped in a time of crisis so that we can recover quickly and minimize risks to our residents. As you all know, through the City of Palm Beach Gardens and in collaboration with all 10 of the Palm Beach North municipalities, the Chamber applied for a grant um, through the DEO to, put to, to hire a company to come in and, and develop a disaster resiliency plan, a regional disaster, disaster resiliency plan. And this plan is going to help mitigate, um, prepare for, and respond to extreme weather, climate change, public health, and technology-related um, emergency events. The project team from Cambridge Solutions, who you've all worked with as well, developed the Resiliency Action Plan with input from all 10 of our municipalities, our local businesses, and our regional partners who, and other regional partners from inside and outside the community. Um, they were solicited to gather available information on the region's potential vulnerabilities, really identify our risks, and create a plan for building a more resilient region. With oversight from the Chamber's Disaster Resiliency Task Force, which included Deputy City Manager Stephen Stepp, and of course, Mr. David Reyes, your uh, Director of Emergency Management, this effort is the first step in initiating broader action among the Palm Beach North residents and businesses to improve regional resilience. We wanna give you a quick idea of, of what this whole process looked like. And in developing, and, and I totally completely am not moving through the slides here, and I apologize for that. Um, in developing this action plan, the project team identified potential risk and vulnerabilities here in the Palm Beach North region. And to do this, we conducted a series of outreach efforts. We sent a survey out to all 10 of our municipalities. We surveyed all of our membership. And of course, we interviewed many leaders, like I mentioned earlier, from inside and outside of, of our county. Now I'm going to ask Kathleen Joy to, give, to go over the results from the surveys and the workshop that followed. Thank you, Noel, and good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. So here in this slide, you can see the top five risks that are ranked by the local governments, and those are flooding, high wind and heavy rains associated with hurricanes or coastal storm events, storm surge, sea level rise, and threats to cybersecurity. And then on this slide, you can see the top five risks ranked by our local businesses, and that's loss of power, communications, or utilities, epidemics, threats to cybersecurity, human-caused acts such as um, hazardous material spills or acts of terrorism, and flooding. 
So after reviewing the survey findings, the project team conducted a preliminary risk and vulnerability analysis to assess the impact of flooding, storm surge, sea level rise, and extreme heat within the Palm Beach North region. And with the data from both the outreach and analysis, these are the top four risks that were of the importance to this particular region, and those are extreme weather, climate change, technology, and public health. So we covered these four risks dur during a stakeholder workshop that was held on March 31st, 2022, and the goal of this workshop was to set priorities among potential risks and impacts to the Palm Beach North region, identify and prioritize strategies to address these risks, and identify roles and responsibilities to implement these strategies. And we have 36 stakeholders from both the public and the private sector participate in this workshop where they provided input through four breakout groups that covered the top four risk areas that I mentioned earlier. And so all of this information was used to develop the action plan that we're here to talk to you about today. And these actions listed are going to help improve our resilience during the four phases of emergency management. And, you know, we have this great plan. Um, what are we going to do with it, right? And so I'm actually going to turn it over to Chip Armstrong, and he is going to talk to us about our next step. Thank you so much, Kathleen, and thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, especially City Manager Ferris. Thank you so much. Um, developing this plan highlighted many of the opportunities for local governments and businesses in Palm Beach North uh, to work together to build the region's resilience. While the actions, time frames, and roles are noted in the plan, and you all should have a digital copy of that, um, excuse me, and businesses of the region to undertake and begin moving this plan forward. These include the following steps outlined on this slide. The action plan is only an initial step toward a broader, more comprehensive process of building resilience in Palm Beach North region. Updating the plan every five years will provide an opportunity to refresh and evaluate new data, assess the relevancy of strategies based on the data, identify new strategies where needed, <coughs> excuse me, and measure progress towards building resilience in the region. I urge you to read the plan because it will be on the final exam in two weeks. It's on the Chamber's website, and I'm gonna turn it over to Noel if you have any questions in the closing style. Yeah, I, I just, you know, thank you again. Uh, you know, we would, not, we would not have been able to do this plan, and, and it's, a, it's a very comprehensive plan, and I don't know if you've had a chance to really look at it. It's a lot of information, but my gosh, there's a lot of great information in there. Um, but we could not have done this without your support. And uh, we really appreciate um, you always being there for the chamber, and we can't thank you enough. And we'll take some questions if we have time, if time permits. Thank you, Noel and Chip and Kathleen. It's such a pleasure to have you here tonight. We appreciate it. And as you know, the city is always willing to help the chamber. We appreciate the collaboration, and we're really impressed with the report. So I will turn it to my council. I'll start over here with Council Member Tinsley. Do you have any comments or questions? No, I just want to say thank you very much, and I look forward to reading it and having my final exam. But um, <laughs> uh, is this something that we can add a link on our website to share with our communities going forward? Is this, um, I mean, obviously we need to look at it, but that's something that I'd like to consider as well if the council is in agreement and staff. But um, thank you. This is what makes our the North End uh, so special because we are always willing to collaborate and do something like this to benefit everybody. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Carl, do you have anything you want to add? No, I'll just say something real quick. We're all friends, and most of us in this room. So, And like what Maria used to say when she was here, and now we have her on the county commission, is uh, you know, we're all family. So especially when things like hurricanes hit, you know, we need to come together as a community. And we work well with you because you guys are great people. So it makes it easy for us and, and you know, and our staff. And, and the community gravitates towards the North End Chamber because it's probably one of the best chambers in the state and because of you guys. So, you know, we're here and, you know, we're all in it together. No matter what title we all carry, it really doesn't matter because it's all about the community. So you guys are doing a great job and you know you always have my support. And Chip, you owe me lunch. So, um, I'm good. Thanks, Noel. Great presentation.
Clark? I have no questions, but thank you very much for the efforts. I know this is a, a lot of work, so I know that you didn't write this by yourself. So, <laughs> but I know very well done from the chamber, and thank you for the effort. Vice Mayor Burke. Thank you for me, too. I remember the initial meetings. It was quite a long time ago when we had our first meetings discussing the feasibility of this and to see it come together the way that it has. It really is a labor of love for our community. And just thanks for taking the lead on this. Thank you so much. All right. Next, we have our legislative update. We're honored to have our Senator Bobby Powell, if you could please come to the podium. Thank you. Good evening, Council, Mayor, and all Council members. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to present before you today after a long, almost never-ending session. Of course, we had uh, a legislative session that ended up going 63 days, and then we went into special session C, as well as special session D this year. Uh, it's rather uh, important, and uh, it's a little bit after those sessions, but it's important that I come before you all to give you just a quick legislative update. Of course, my name is Bobby Powell, Jr. Of course, I am also an AICP certified planner, and the senator for the northern parts of Palm Beach County, which encapsulate everything from the city of West Palm Beach over to the town of Palm Beach, Royal Palm Beach, and goes all the way up to uh, Juneau Beach, to Cuesta, the Martin County line, actually. You look real quick. This is just a recap of what the district includes, a number of uh, municipalities. There are 39 municipalities in Palm Beach County. And if you look at this list, it looks like I've gotten the lion's share of them all. Palm Beach Gardens, of course, sticks out. Palm Beach Gardens, as you know, is the largest land area in Palm Beach County. And luckily for me, the last six years, I've had the privilege to serve Palm Beach Gardens in its entirety as the senator, uh, holding it down with my colleague, uh, bipartisan, uh, Rick Roth, is the representative who I had the opportunity to work with while we've done legislation in Tallahassee. Now, in the House, in the legislature, there's 120 representatives. I served there for four years. Right now, there's 42 Democrats, 77 Republicans, and there's a vacant seat. We're under the process of elections, so that will change in the upcoming November 8th election, I believe. The Florida Senate, there's 40 senators. There are 16 Democrats, of which I am one. Senate Democratic leader pro temp, uh, which means if anything happens to the current leader, I'll be the leader. And then there's 24 Republicans. Senators, we have the ability to file unlimited numbers of bills. Unfortunately, the members of the House only can file seven, so I am capped by the number of bills that I can get a House member to carry with me. This year, I had the opportunity to serve on the Appropriations Committee and the Rules Committee. Those two committees are the committees where you will see every single bill that will hit the floor, for the most part. Uh, there have been magical things that have happened in the legislature in which bills ended up on the floor without going through appropriations or rules, but in general, they're supposed to go through there. I've also had the opportunity to serve on criminal justice, commerce and tourism, health policy, and the Joint Committee on Public Oversight in which I am the alternating chair. Of course, this will change after the upcoming election. Last year, I introduced quite a few bills. Senate Bill 226, which passed, was care for retired law enforcement dogs. That bill is a um, kind of like an opportunity to recognize not only our law enforcement officers, but the canines who specialize in service with them, they have heightened senses of security. They do a number of things that machines cannot do. And once they've retired, they need additional care. And what we've done is provided a, I believe it's a $300,000 a year uh, appropriation that will allow for law enforcement officers or someone who specializes in taking care of those dogs to continue their care after they've come out of um, service. Senate Bill 4 414, Family Caregiver for Certified Nursing Assistance Program. One of the things we realize in this community and throughout the state of Florida is that once a person has been in a situation in which they need to be cared for, usually the caretaker sometimes usually ends up um, in a worse situation or passing away before they do, but a lot of times those individuals uh, bear the brunt of stress in terms of trying to maintain a household, 
trying to keep things going. What this bill would have done, it moved through a couple of committees, but it did not pass. But this bill would have allowed for those individuals to apply for assistance to receive funding to care for a person who's in the home. What it also does, it allows for two years after they've cared for the person who's in the home to be able to apply to become a certified nurse and assistant, which allows for us to add to the number of caretakers uh, that we have, which we have a shortage in the state of Florida. Also passed Senate Bill 1502, Estates and Trust, which dealt with codifying some language related to the spouse of a person who has passed away in terms of how they remain on a trust and how those trust uh, funds can be dealt with. Mental health for minors, revising penalties for nonviolent offenses, direct file of an information on a child, someone between 14 and 17 years old has been one of my sticking points for the last six years in the Senate, four years in the House, over the 10 years that I've been a part of the legislature, we've worked on that. And we've also dealt with deputy, I'm sorry, duties of the Inspector General uh, for the Department of Corrections. One of the biggest things that we do in Tallahassee, the only thing that we have to do every year when we go to Tallahassee is pass a balanced budget, which requires us to have the members of the House and the Senate pass a budget, and then it goes to the governor for signing. And as you all know, uh, the governor has the ability to do a line, line, line item veto. This year, uh, with the help of my colleagues here in Palm Beach County and a number of you all who have supported uh, and went up to Tallahassee and advocated and fought and called the governor's office and called the Senate president and the speaker of the House's office, we were able to work together to bring back $43.5 million, $43 million in our budget. Uh, the great majority of that goes to Palm Beach State College for the $25 million that we received in the budget for the dental school. There was $10 million as well for the, uh, um, $10 million for the Cox Science Center and Aquarium, but we also received money for Palm Beach Gardens we had half a million dollars for the Palm Beach Garden stormwater system and improvement. So thank you all for your help and allowing me to work on that with your lobbyist who is not here today. Uh, that would be Matt Forrest from Ballard Partners. We have a great working relationship. I did actually call Matt before I came here and he didn't pick up the phone. Don't tell him I told you, but um, we have a good, have a good, he'll see this on TV. We have a good working relationship, so Matt has been awesome to work with, and I look forward to continuing working with him. Some of the major session issues, the budget. For the first time, we passed a $112 billion budget. Now, that's an increase of over $30 billion since the time I entered the legislature. I was looking back a few years ago when I started, 2012, uh, and the budget was somewhere around $80 billion. We've gotten this year up to $112 billion. A lot of that money was supplemented by federal funds. However, this was the largest budget in the history of the state of Florida. We still had, not only that, we had the largest budget cuts uh, under the governor in the history of the state of Florida. Some of the important issues that we dealt with, as you all know, uh, one of the most important issues or prevalent issues in the news right now has been Roe versus Wade. Well, this year, House Bill 5, Senate Bill 146, we dealt with the fetal and infant mortality reduction, which made Florida a state that has a 15-week abortion ban. There's been some outcry today as the uh, governor removed, I believe, one of the state's attorneys for uh, saying that he would not prosecute someone for violating the 15-week abortion ban. That happened this year in Tallahassee. That's where we're at in terms of the state of Florida. Election integrity. Senate Bill 524, election administration, this year, last year we created new rules related to elections, and this year was no different. Uh, of course, I was opposed to some of these changes because I believe that some of the things that are being done have the ability to restrict voting. However, we do know and understand that if people get out, there's nothing that can stop the voice of people from being heard. But the election administration legislation allows for uh, a police force in the Department of State specifically designed to look at elections. We also dealt with, with redistricting this year. This was one of the most crucial issues that we dealt with. We have the Senate maps, of which I'll tell you I'm still going to be your senator. However, I will not cover the entire city of Palm Beach Gardens now. I'll have to share that with my colleague to the north who will be and who is currently Gail Harrell. But I'll still start at PGA Boulevard and go down south. Uh, and I still keep my high school, Palm Beach Gardens, of which I graduated back in 1999. That will still be in my district. So I still have parts of Palm Beach Garden, so we will still work 
very hard and diligently to make sure that the things that Palm Beach Garden wants, Palm Beach Gardens gets. The House maps and the Senate maps. So the state legislative maps are what we call Senate joint resolution or joint resolutions. Joint resolutions pass through the House and the Senate and then they go to the Department of Justice to be reviewed and then those maps are now the official maps once the courts say they are okay. The congressional maps are a little bit different. Congressional maps pass as a bill because they don't deal with the House and the Senate. The congressional maps, anything that passes as a bill, the governor has veto power. So we passed the map in the Senate. The House also passed the map. Uh, we got together and we passed an official map. We ended up with that map. The governor decided to draw his own map, of which the legislature decided we were not going to go with that map, kicked it away, passed the map of the legislature. We went home. I went back to work doing my day job, dealing with my, my wife and my child. No, the governor called a special session in which he had an individual from his office uh, draw his map, his version of what he felt should be the uh, congressional map. We went back to Tallahassee and that map passed on a party line vote. So recognize however you feel about the governor or the legislature, just recognize that this is a situation that was created in which we're supposed to have balance of powers. There's the executive branch, the judicial branch, and then there is the legislative branch. At this point, we do know that the governor appoints judges, and we've seen how that has worked out with a number of the court cases. The governor also appoints, I'm sorry, the governor also has control over members of the legislature now because there are members who are afraid if they do what they think is right, and this is personal conversation between me and some of my colleagues, that the governor will endorse against them and they will lose their race. And that means the governor, for the first time in the history of Florida, or at least while I've been born, which is not that long, um, we have a governor who has control over the House, I'm sorry, the executive, the judicial, and the legislative branches, which could be problematic. So we just have to pay attention to that as we move forward. That was special session C in which those maps were passed. I went back up to Tallahassee on April 22nd, 2022. We passed those maps as well as uh, the legislation related to special districts, which uh, took Disney out of Reedy Creek and will put them, uh, which will eliminate that special taxing district. We can talk about that if you'd like, but let's move on to some of the other major session issues. We dealt with uh, 1557, uh, the parental rights in education, which was aptly called the Don't Say Gay Bill. We also dealt with HB7, the Individual Freedoms or Woke Act. Uh, we dealt with 1467, which was a education book ban bill. Uh, 758, Charter School Review Commission Bill. Uh, HB or Senate Bill 514, the Substitution of Workforce Experience for post-secondary edu educational requirements. Now that was a, a bill that I, I thought was a pretty good bill as we talk about our economies. This allows for students who are working as interns to still receive credit in order to be received, I'm, I'm sorry, to, in order to get the, um, in order to get the, what do you call it? When, when our kids graduate from high school? Bright, bright futures, that's right, that's right. Give it up for Amy on for bright futures. Amy on an intern in my office. And then there was um, financial literacy ed instruction in public schools, which was a bill that I thought was pretty good and it dealt with a lot of what we could say in terms of saving our students. We passed the biggest tax package, tax break for the state of Florida in which HB 7071 created all of these back, I'm sorry, all of these tax holidays. One of the top ones is the back to school tax holiday from July 25th through August 7th, which is going on right now. So if you haven't had the opportunity to go pick up your children's or your, child or your friend's children's um, school clothes and supplies, you can do that now because it will be tax free. That's a good one for me. One of the other ones that I'm out of that stage, thankfully, last year would have been helpful, but I'm out of that stage, is the baby and toddler closing, clothing tax break. Well, we still pay for the clothes. Uh, that is from July 1st, 2022 until June 30th, 2023. So that's an extended program that allows for you to get a tax break on baby diapers and baby clothing. Children books holidays from May 14th through August 14th. My child needs a story every night before she goes to bed, will not go to bed unless she gets a story. So that's a good one for me and my wife, Whitney, and a number of others that we have up here. The Freedom Week holiday from 
uh, July 1st through July 7th, which is already over. But just take a look at some of these things that we passed in the largest tax package that we've done uh, this far in the legislative process. I didn't mention, didn't mention, sorry, we have it hold, held up there. Uh, we have a reduction of the total fuel taxes by 25.3%. That will start in October, from October 1st through the 31st. So that will save us some money in terms of it, uh, what we're doing at the gas pump because it has become extremely uh, expensive to drive your vehicle. Special Session D. That was the Florida legislature we wrapped up recently. This one was related to property tax insurance. And some of the highlights of this bill, we have com condominium safety. This requires visual inspection for condominium, condominium buildings three stories or higher that have been occupied for 30 years. This dealt directly with the Surfside incident. We want to make sure that we don't have Surfside anywhere else here in the state of Florida. We have the new reinsurance program that authorizes $2 billion of new reinsurance to assist policyholders. Uh, this is for reinsurance coverage that is provided at no cost to the insurer. Uh, and also, roofing claims insurers may not refuse to write or renew policies on homes with roofs that are less than 15 years old, solely based on the roof's age. We also passed that legislation. There was some, some hiccups in that legislation because although we passed it and there's a number of things that are in it, it does not indicate whether this will lower your property insurance over the next year. So that is one of the challenges that we had with Special Session D. But that legislation did move forward and we're hopeful, cautiously optimistic, that in the future we won't see 25 to 35 percent increases in our property insurance like many of us saw this year being priced, of course, out of paradise. That is a synopsis of what we do. Uh, if you look on this slide here, this is my team. Before I introduce my team, uh, I will tell you that my office is located at 2715 North Australian Avenue. I'm in Suite 105. The phone number there is 561-650-6880. I am State Senator Bobby Powell Jr., currently representing Senate District 30, running for re-election for Senate District 24, which comes not all the way to the Martin County line now, but just below at PJ Boulevard South. So no longer do I have the Palm Beach Gardens Mall, but I do get to keep Palm Beach Gardens High School Go Gators, and I look forward to continuing to serve you with my colleagues in the legislature, of which I'm getting in those senior years. When I started, uh, I was a young man. Now I'm old school, got gray hairs, so we're ready to rock and roll. We'll continue serving at the highest level. My staff includes Diane Andre Esquire. She can be reached at andre.diane at flsenate.gov. Michelle DeMarco, she's based in Tallahassee. She can be reached at demarco.michelle at flsenate.gov. She does all of our press releases as well as our media. Amyon Hamlet at flsenate.gov. She is our legislative intern this year coming to us from Florida, Florida Atlantic University. And our chief of staff, attorney Kirsty Miles is here. She can be reached at miles.kirsty at flsenate.gov. Once again, I also remind you that a life of service is indeed a life that counts. I am State Senator Bobby Powell Jr. and I'm pleased to continue representing you and I will entertain any questions at this time. Thank you, Senator. I don't see any gray hair, so I don't know about that part. Uh, we appreciate everything and I love having Palm Beach Gardens listed at the top of the appropriations you brought home. So thank you so much for your representation and I will start on the other end. Does anyone on this end have any questions or comments? I just have a, a little question on the mapping, Bobby. Um, like, is reorganizing the maps more of a special interest, or, or what's the what's the purpose behind it, and why would we want to? Because I'm sure they didn't chop up West Palm Beach, so why are? Because you've represented the city very well as long as I've been here, which is going on seven years now, um, or however long you've been in office. But but um, what do we what do we benefit by you not representing the northern half of Palm Beach Gardens? Are we losing traction because of that? I'd be hopeful uh, and cautiously optimistic, there's that word again, that by adding another senator where we cut up the district, uh, we will get better representation because now there's two of us to fight for the appropriations for Palm Beach Gardens. Mm -hmm. You also will now have bipartisan representation in terms of Gail Harrell is a Republican and I'm a Democrat, but in the Senate that hasn't really mattered because I've been able to try to say this politically correct. Um, I've been able to push through, right? 
push through a lot of the issues in order to make sure that we're getting our funding. And I think that Gail will be helpful. And if she's not, I'll make sure I get behind her to push her to make sure that she's helpful when it comes to uh, the city of Palm Beach Gardens. We go through the redistricting process every two years after the decennial census. And that's the process in which the legislative body comes together and we design the maps for the House and the Senate. For the, and we look at the population, 21.5 million people in the state of Florida. You have to chop that up into 40 Senate districts as well as chop it up into 120 House districts. They try to uh, make sure that those districts uh, go along borders. Don't, they really try to rarely cut up cities, but they, they want to go, go along roads, main arteries. Uh, so my district now comes down portions of the Turnpike and then portions of I-95 to make sure that it is um, what they would call, classify as a compact district. But they also try not to break up communities of like interest, some of those communities like the Hispanic community or the African American community or certain communities that are historically bonded. It's a, a long and arduous process. This year was a lot different from the time that I saw it happen in 2012 when I was a part of the legislature as a legislative aide, but the process then was a lot more uh, legislative intense, meaning that the senators and representatives have had a lot more to do with it in terms of drawing maps and figuring maps out. Because that went to a lawsuit and the legislature was sued and we ended up having new Senate maps in 2015, which I ran for the Senate in 2016, uh, they didn't want to get the legislatures in the process because sometimes when you put Democrats and Republicans and people who have an, a, vetris, I'm sorry, a vested interest in that process, things can be convoluted. So this time, it's not going to the courts. What will go to the courts is the governor's map, but it won't go until after the election on August, I'm sorry, in November. But the House and Senate maps, they made sure to keep the legislators at bay. And if there was any conversations had, those had to be recorded in terms of writing and making sure that everything was on the up and up. So we did not end up in a situation where the legislature was sued again because members of this body try to protect their own seats or create seats for their friends. So that's pr pretty much part of the intent. Another part of it is the party that's in power always ends up really heavy handedly drawing the maps. And one of the reasons, to, to be frank with you, that the map goes a little bit further south is right now a lot of the areas that I do represent may be a little bit more uh, Republican dominated, which does not create a safe seat for the Republican to the north. So there, there could be a potential challenge there and that seat may swing, but by grabbing some of the areas that are more Republican based in the northern parts of Palm Beach County, it creates a little bit more safer seat for uh, somebody who runs in that seat if they're of that particular party. Now that's not what the map's supposed to be based on, but if you look at it, that's a little bit of it. My seat has been drawn further south. I go into Lake Worth and a little bit of Lantana right now. And if you look at it in terms of demographics, it does pick up a little bit more minorities in that district, but it also becomes a little bit more democratic than the seat is right now. So I do have, if you think about it, uh, a challenger for my seat who is Republican, but th the likelihood of that person being able to win, he would have to draw a lot of people to come out. He'd have to have some rock star status to be able to overcome uh, me in that district. All right, well, thank you for that. And then um, hopefully that senator will come in front of us soon and give us his vision, his direction. Hopefully he will work well with the city because it's, it's up to us. It, she, it, sorry, it's sorry. Gail Harrell. Oh. It's a she, Gail Harrell. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> It's all right, Carl. We'll um, make her, we'll make her I, I was paying attention. I said, okay. Anyway, uh, it's up to us to voice the opinion. Whatever benefits the city of Palm Beach Gardens is, is what we need to say. So hopefully she will be in front of us soon so we can get to know her well. So thank you, Bobby. Thank you. And remember, I'm a product of Palm Beach Gardens. You know, I went to Palm Beach Gardens High School where I played football and ran track, all county, all conference, all state. Uh, so when it comes to Palm Beach Gardens, I can't do any of that now, right? I breathe hard running to the parking lot. But uh, when it comes to Palm Beach Gardens, you have an avid fighter regardless of who's here. As long as I'm here, we're going to make sure we get the job done. Thank you. What? Yeah, you know, I, I could ask you a thousand questions, but I'm going to just keep it real simple. $112 billion budget. A lot of that money came from the federal government. 
15 years ago. I remember when it capped $70 billion in 2008. That was a shock to everybody. Where the hell is the money going for the Sadowski Fund, and why can't we get the state to help us with affordable housing? Because that is such a crisis everywhere in the state, and yet every year you guys seem to take the money and put it somewhere else, and now we've got record amounts of, of reserves in the state, and there's not enough money for affordable housing. Can you please give a short, because we had a long agenda tonight. Right, I love you, and I could listen to you all day, but this is a, this is a topic that's very important to all of us, uh, and our chamber of people are here as well, and I know they'd love to hear your brief take. Absolutely. So the funding for the Sadowski Fund, a couple of years ago, we made sure that it will look like uh, we fully fund Sadowski. How does it look like we fully fund Sadowski? 50% of the funds that are set aside for Sadowski are now guaranteed to go to affordable housing funding. The other two quarters, or one-fourth and one-fourth, go to sustainability-type programs. So you will hear some of my colleagues say, we fully fund Sadowski, right? But that's not exactly true. So now we fully funded at 50%, and 50% 50 of that this year ended up being $368.2 million. I want to say 368 or 386.2. A uh, little bit more than $350 million for Sadowski, which you would think is a lot, but it's not considering the amount that it costs for people to be housed here in Palm Beach County now. One of the things that we're seeing here in the northern parts of Palm Beach County, or Palm Beach North, go Palm Beach North, I am Palm Beach North, right, is that people are having a little bit more difficult time finding housing. We wanna bring great students back home who go away to college, whether they go to the University of Florida, Florida a and University, Florida State University, we do wanna bring those kids back home because we wanna keep our best and our brightest. However, at housing prices, somewhere around $3,000 a month for a one bedroom apartment, most kids, I say most kids, most young adults cannot afford to come to Palm Beach County, even at an entry level position. So what has happened is we have said that we are fully funding Sadowski. However, we're only partially funding it right now. And the only way we can fix that is the legislature has to go in and change the way that we did it a couple of years ago to make sure that there's nothing that stops us from fully funding Sadowski. Now, that's not the only problem that we have with regard to affordable housing. Of course, a number of single family homes now are being purchased by out of state investors. We're seeing also some of the HOAs have been infiltrated by individuals who've gotten on boards and purchased a majority of the condos in order to push people out of their units. We as a legislature have to figure out a way without being heavy handed and being big brother in everyone's business, still maintaining some type of free market approach, but allowing for the market to work so that people who've grown up here in Palm Beach County or in the state of Florida are able to stay here. Well, I would encourage you to talk to those guys over there because we had a great meeting the other day and I think we've got some options and I'm sure you've heard them all, but thank you for the report. Thank you. I'll give up my time. Thank you, Rochelle. Just thank you for all you do for the community. The, the big issues were addressed, the MAPS and, and Sadowski. Of course, the past 20 years, the fund has been swept completely. So now that we're funding at 50%, it's, uh, we've got a long way to catch up. Thank you. Marcy? Senator, thank you for uh, coming here and giving us an update. I really appreciate it. And thank you, of course, for your support of the county and um, of course, the support of Palm Beach Gardens, and my kids went to uh, Gardens High, so oh, absolutely you. appreciate that. Thank you for doing what you're doing with the insurance, because I was dropped twice this year, and my insurance rates went up uh, $2,000, so a lot of money. I really appreciate that, and I think Carl brought that up um, earlier this year, um, so I know he was affected as well. Um, I'm sure everybody was, and... Um, I do want to say, though, over the next session, um, if you could, being the planner extraordinaire that you are, um, known you for many years as a planner, as your, uh, as your uh, job and the prior to being uh, our representative, um, I would really highly encourage you to support uh, mobility, uh, Senate Bill uh, 1524, and ha encourage all of your uh, friends and colleagues to support the House Bill 1415. Um, and thank you so much. You have your work cut out for you, and we really appreciate all that you're doing. Thank you very, very kindly. I certainly appreciate you all, and I'm so glad that I get the opportunity 
to serve Palm Beach Gardens. Remember, when it comes to affordable housing, we do have an opportunity to do something here in Palm Beach County. Pretty soon there will be an initiative on our ballots for $200 million in terms of affordable housing and pushing people to do that. So, you know, I would encourage everyone to just look at that and take advantage of that. Also, um, do recognize that, as I indicated, I am a planner, and I did not also realize that uh, my office, my team would be here as well, so it's good to see uh, the people who I work with here. I'm not going to, you know, but it, it's great to be here with them. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to Gardens. We always like it when you're here, and we look forward to collaborating with you and Senator Gail Harrell going forward. And thank you so much for your time and for your representation. Thank you, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Next is comments from the public, and I do have one comment card that is n not on the agenda. And could Mr. Michael Winter please come to the podium? State your name and address, please. For the record, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Michael Winter. Uh, 13965 Willow K Drive, North Palm Beach, Florida, 33408. Um, good evening to the City Council and staff. Uh, I'm Michael Winter. I'm the founder and chairman of the Palm Beach North Athletic Foundation. Seated here tonight with me is Tucker Fredrickson from 1000 North, Charlie Burris from Seacoast, and Steve Teachout, all the way from Atlanta. He's with Carrier Global. He flew in to show support for our foundation. As you may or may not be aware, Carrier has become a, a key partner of ours. Uh, for those in the room that aren't aware of our foundation, we are a 501c3 nonprofit comprised of passionate individuals, uh, a volunteer board uh, of directors, advisory council, and now we have numerous and a growing roster of both corporate and individual donors. We are the private component of the public-private partnership that is for the, 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 for the partnership that's been forged to develop and construct a 200,000 square foot indoor facility right in the Gardens North County District Park. Uh, we are here tonight because we recently submitted an update of where we are and our um, progress of getting to fruition and groundbreaking. Um, we're excited where we are. Um, we've, while it's been quiet, a quiet fundraising process, that's not unusual for foundations like ours, but we've been quietly, strategically, and diligently cultivating a, a fantastic roster of donors. Uh, we hope that everyone consumed and read the update we provided, I guess, a week ago. And thank you to the city staff for promptly uh, scheduling a meeting and we look forward to meeting with you on Monday and that, that is all thank you so much for coming we appreciate it all right next we have our city manager report Ron do you have a report this evening thank you mayor council members I have a couple of items to bring to your attention the first one it uh, gives me great pleasure uh, to share with you the city of Palm Beach Gardens purchasing department is the recipient of the 2022 Achievement of Excellence in Procurement Award. I'd also like to note that this is the ninth year in a row that that department has received this award. Our Purchasing Director, <laughs> Kumra, our Purchasing Director, works very hard to provide the city with the required goods and services uh, that are most cost effective, uh, and he ensures that we get the best quality products at the lowest price and he's one heck of a negotiator, and he's a great team member on our management team, and sometimes he's pretty funny, too. <laughs> Kumra, please stand up and be recognized. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, that is our entire department in the purchasing division. <laughs> All right, so uh, in addition to that, I'd like to call Candace Temple, Temple, our uh, public media relations director, to the podium. She has some information to share with you on our EV program and uh, our proposed budget, which is now out on the website. So, Candace, if you would, and introduce your guest. Will do. Good evening, Candace Temple, public media relations director. Um, one of our long-term, ter uh, long-time outreach goals has been to 
educate the public on our electric vehicle charging stations that we have here in the city. As you know, we've been gradually rolling this program out for quite some time. Our public services department has done a great job of um, scouting out the best equipment. It's easy to use. Uh, purchasing is in the process of assisting them with expanding this program even further. But I had the opportunity this summer uh, to take on an intern. This is Ryan. Um, Ryan is a University of Miami student. She's a resident of uh, Palm Beach County, and she's been a lifeguard at our aquatic center for several years to the point that this summer she actually was training. She was doing training of lifeguards. Um, so talk about homegrown. Well, as quiet as it's kept though, Ryan has another talent. Um, her degree is in video production at the University of Miami. And before she goes off to Hollywood, um, <laughs> we have uh, taken advantage of her talents. And um, I wanna show you her final project, wh which is uh, this video. The city of Palm Beach Gardens prides itself on being at the forefront of embracing green practices, something we call the green wave. One of our latest advancements has been the addition of nine hybrid city vehicles to our fleet and the installation of electric vehicle charging stations at various city parks and facilities. These stations are available for use by the public at no cost. However, city vehicles have priority. Currently, there are five areas where these free charging stations are installed. City Hall, Gardens Park, the Gardens North County District Park, the Tennis and Pickleball Center, and Sandhill Crane Golf Club. Be sure to download the ChargePoint app and create an account in order to locate and use each charging station. Once you have signed into the app, circles will appear on your map with a number indicating how many charging stations are in that area. The color around the circle indicates the current status of that charger. The color green means it's available. Blue means that it's in use and gray means the status is currently not available. Each station features a dual charger, allowing for two vehicles to be charged at one time per station. The parking spots associated with each station are also painted green and have this charging symbol at the center so they are easy to spot and you know exactly where to go. Once you arrive, hold your phone up to the sensor with this image and ChargePoint will automatically open. You may have to unlock your phone. From there, you can start charging and track the progress through the app. The app will also notify you once your vehicle stops or slows down its power intake. We hope you'll take advantage of these free EV charging stations soon. Join us as we ride the green wave. Oh yeah. Okay, there it is. So uh, I wanted Ryan, luckily she was able to be here to be recognized for her hard work. Um, she did everything from the script writing Casting, unfortunately, she was limited in casting options. Um, she edited, she uh, videography, audio, what else? Uh, animation, The um, our logo at the end, she animated that. She is very, very talented. And um, this video looks as good, if not better, than anything I would have paid a professional um, in the industry to do. So thank you, Ryan. <laughs> Thank you. I don't really have anything else to say, but I hope you guys all liked it. And it made sense. Yes, maybe? Okay. <laughs> perfect. It was perfect. Great. Okay, I think I want to close now. The next, um, the next project, as Mr. Ferris mentioned, um, just a quick update on our proposed budget. Now, usually I'm not the one that you hear getting up here uh, talking about the budget. I'm in public relations and that's because I do not math. Um, but luckily we have a great finance department that has been working hard um, for several months to roll out um, a new tool that is now available to our residents. Um, we have a new way of looking at the budget, we're saying, and 
Um, it's available now online. We've just debuted our proposed budget. And um, as always is our goal to keep an informed and engaged constituency, we hope they will use this tool and find it um, a breath of fresh air. Uh, we're using OpenGov. It is a platform, um, it's a cloud-based platform that allows the residents to explore the budget. It's interactive. It uses a very user-friendly graphical interface. So the uh, spreadsheet, we're saying goodbye to the Excel spreadsheet, and now they're gonna see those charts more interactive and they can really drill down. They're gonna get the same information um, that they would have from our previous format for the budget, but this is definitely a lot more pleasurable to navigate. Um, we, that is available on our website and we've rolled it out on social media as well. Um, and again, we hope that the residents will find it easy and, and maybe um, will pique the curiosity of people that normally wouldn't get very involved in um, our budget process. So uh, kudos to the finance department for rolling that out. Prior to the public version of the platform, we as staff trained on an internal version. And again, remember I don't math, so I will say it just made my portion of the budget process so much easier um, this year. It really is very easy um, to, to learn. So uh, we're glad to be taking this new modern step with the way we present the budget to the public. Thank you. That concludes my report. Thank you so much, Ron and Cameron, on behalf of all of our council, congratulations. It's just one more affirmation of how appreciative of we are for all the hard work you do. And I've never heard math as a verb. I love it. That was great. And um, we're excited for the budget to be so transparent and available to all of our residents. So thank you. And Ryan, I can't be more proud of you. That was fabulous. Thank you. And especially the subject. It was wonderful. All right, off we go. So next we have the consent agenda. Is anyone pulling off of the agenda for consent? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All right. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Thank you so much. Tonight we are holding quasi-judicial hearings on the following cases. Resolution 45, 2022, Planned Unit Development, PUD Amendment to PGA National Commerce Park. And Resolution 46, 2022, which is Avenir Development, LLC, Site Plan Approval. This means that the City Council is required by law to base its decision on the evidence contained in the record of this proceeding, which consists of the testimony at the time of the hearing. The materials which are in the official City file on this application and any documents presented during this hearing. The council is also required by law to allow cross-examination of any witnesses who testify tonight. Cross-examination may occur after the staff, the applicant, and other participants have made their presentations and will be permitted in the order of the witness's appearance. It is necessary that anyone who testifies at the hearing remain until the conclusion of the hearing in order to be able to respond to any questions. If you plan to testify this evening or wish to offer written comments, Please fill out a card if you've not already done so and give it to our city clerk over here. The city clerk will now swear in all persons who intend to offer testimony this evening on any of these two cases. Patty. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. If the clerk could please read the title. Ordinance 8, 2022, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 18 businesses at Article 1. In general, by adopting new Section 18-1, minimum notice for residential rental payment increases and new Section 18-2 penalties, reserving Sections 18-3 to 18-30 for future legislation, providing that each and every other section and subsection of Chapter 18 Businesses shall remain in full force and effect as previously adopted, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you so much. Has anything changed since first reading? And do we need a presentation? 
Max, I think we're all, everyone feel good about this? Okay, anyone want to speak on this item? I know it's second reading. Any more comments or questions? I'm just grateful for you guys to bring it up last week, last month, so thank you. And I did actually receive a, uh, a phone call from uh, a resident that did not get the notice and was upset and wanted to know what to do. And I said, well, we have to wait till after the meeting tonight to see if it becomes official and then contact code enforcement. All right, great, thank you. Parsons? I didn't do that. Okay. Uh, just a question, if the county passes there, do we then opt out of it? Uh, if well, they pass a notice? Um, they haven't even gone to first reading yet. I don't mean to answer. Max, do you wanna go ahead? Whenever they adopt theirs, if there's, what, to the extent that there's a conflict, then ours would supersede. Okay, good. Good, that was it. All right, beautiful. So I will close the hearing. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? Make a motion to approve Ordinance 8, 2022. I'll second. All right, it is moved and seconded that Ordinance 8, 2022 is on the floor. Any further discussion? No, okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion passes, 5-0. Thank you all very much. We move on to Ordinance 9. If the clerk would kindly read the title, please. Ordinance 9, 2022, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 74, Utilities, by repealing Article 4, Water Shortage Regulations, in its entirety and readopting Article 4 as revised, and with a new Landscape Irrigation Conservation Regulations to provide for local implementation of the mandatory year-round landscaping irrigation conservation measures rules of the South Florida Water Management District. 40E-24 FAC, providing definitions, landscape irrigation measures, exceptions to the landscape irrigation schedule, establishing a requirement to utilize rain sensor technologies, providing variance procedures from certain irrigation limitations and provide for enforcement of and penalties for violation of irrigation regulations, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you so much, Patty. All right, I'll, we'll open the hearing. And for our presentation, I would come back to our attorney, Max Lohman, again, please. Um, this is for pretty much housekeeping in nature. What this is, is back in 2010, the state legislature uh, required the, South, the water management districts to adopt a, uh, or, or promulgate, if you will, a, um, a, a, well, I guess a uniform ordinance is what, it would, what you would call it, um, for water restrictions, because they're model ordinance. And um, it took them quite a while to do that, and they, they have uh, finally, uh, they've accomplished it a couple of years ago, and now they've been uh, pushing it out to the municipalities and asking them to adopt it. Um, the big change here is that you probably recall back in the early 2000s, we had um, water restrictions that were intermittently being placed upon us by the, South, by the various water management districts. Um, and we, back in 2001, the city adopted a uh, water restriction ordinance that was uh, in line with that. And these were these intermittent um, declarations of drought and that would impose various water restrictions, odd numbers, three, your house was an odd number, you watered on X days, and if it was an even number, you watered on the others. And it limited the times and things. Well, what they, uh, because of the water issues in Florida, they have subsequently um, implemented a permanent water restriction to apply these restrictions uh, uniformly across uh, our district and, and um, make it basically year round. And so they've asked that we implement uh, this ordinance. So we took this ordinance and as you'll see in here, there's, there's the strike through an underline. We struck our old ordinance in its entirety and replaced it with this one. It is very, very similar in many, many ways. Um, the only thing it does is instead of make the water restrictions dependent upon a declaration of drought, it makes them 365. Um, that's essentially what it does. It does provide for uh, a variance procedure, which our previous ordinance didn't have as far as if someone needed, wanted relief from these restrictions and can demonstrate a hardship, uh, then they would have to apply to the city and come forward and uh, we could do that. It also adds um, various additional definitions to clarify things. Um, but like I said, other than that, it's largely, uh, it's largely housekeeping. It's pretty much the same thing that we had, again, with just a, a few minor changes and it is the uniform ordinance as promulgated by South Florida. Thank you very much. Anyone wishing to speak on this item? All right, and I don't have any comment cards, so I'm going to close the hearing. Can I get a motion and a second to approve, please? I'll make a motion to approve ordinance nine, nine 2022. Thank second. you. 
second is Carl. Thank you very much. It's moved and seconded. That motion number nine is on the floor and open for discussion. So, Rochelle, you moved. Why don't you go first? Um, let me, I'd like to reserve to hear the other comments. All right, Carl. On this. No, I, um, sorry. Uh, no, it's house cleaning. Okay. It's not really, you know, I don't think it needs much discussion myself, but I'm good with it. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Mark? I don't have any questions, no. Thank you, Marcy. I don't really have any questions. I just have a couple comments and, uh, and a question for the council. Um, first, I just want to start by saying I'm 100% in favor of water conservation. Um, I read through all of this, and as I was reading it, I realized that there are several um, things in here that, is, that makes it very, very tough for our larger communities to adhere to. Um, I spoke with several of our communities. I spoke with a couple lands larger landscape companies to get their uh, opinions. But um, what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you guys, is I'd like to uh, keep it all as is, but uh, work with Max um, over uh, for the second reading and add two additions to this. And that was that is to section 74-75, allowing additional an additional 10 minutes for developments 50 acres or larger, um, and also an exemption for uh, planned developments with a smart moisture sensor control system that meets the requirements of the state if Max uh, feels that that's possible. Bring and those are the only two changes that I'd like to add to this if you guys are all in agreement. Um, and if Max is okay with it after we, he has an opportunity to research. I did speak with Max and I did speak with uh, Ron about this also. All right, let's, um, let's go to Rochelle. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, to, to give a little history on this too, as vice chair of the county's water task force, uh, South Florida Water Management came to us a little bit over a year ago uh, with their intention to make these changes and to put forth a resolution and to ask all the cities uh, to go along with it. Uh, we were asked a couple months later at another meeting to vote on it um, and it was supported in entirety by the water task force and our job at that point was to go back and work with the cities. I had been working behind the scenes with South Florida Water Management, with Ron, with Max, and we finally got language and the, um, the resolution from South Florida management, water management uh, to put before you all tonight. This same one, as it is right here, has been passed by every major city in the county and has been passed by the county commission. Um, Mo all of the North County cities have passed it as is. So we are taking the wording that South Florida management wants in the ordinance to satisfy their needs, and that's what you have before you. Uh, Royal Palm, Lake Worth Drainage District, the, the county, City of Boynton, City of West Palm, City of Boca, Lantana, Tequesta, Jupiter Inlet Colony, Jupiter, Juno Beach, and uh, Village of North Palm Beach and the Town of Lake Park have already passed it, as is. Um, I think when you go into it, there is a way to get the variance that Marcy's asking for. It puts it on South Florida Water Management mm -hmm. instead of on us. They can apply to South Florida Water Management to get that variance for the water sensors. So for us to have to do that within the city, it's going to put a burden on the city when it already exists. Um, as, as far as I can tell in here. And none of the other areas, Boca, West Palm, that also have major country clubs and uh, landscapers have had any problem with it as it is. Thank, thank you, Rochelle. Carl? Um, some of these quieter topics that we think we're going to move through quickly just because of sensitivity of water and things like that. We all have a little bit... Our, we all usually will do a little bit more diligence on something that we might just go eye on and never even, um, you know, really bring it up for discussion. So I also did uh, a lot of diligence myself on this particular topic, and 
and I'm hearing where Rochelle's going, um, and I think Max has brought this up before, and I kind of can parallel without reiterating what she said, some of the conversations that I've had with people around the community and the county. So um, I know Rochelle didn't say it out loud, but I'm in favor of leaving it as it is. So that's my going to be that's going to be my stance on that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So respectfully, I, I also agree with with um, Rochelle and Carl, and um, I, I'm very content with it as it is. There's already a mechanism for variance within South Florida Water Management District, and um, and it's this is something that is a, it's a blanket ordinance, and I, I don't see any reason to um, to tweak it. So um, do we want to, Max, what's our next step? Well, Vote on it, all right, motion. let's go. You've got a motion and a second. All right, so we've got a motion and a second. We've had our no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much. All right. We're moving into our public hearing for resolution 45 now. If the clerk could please read the title. Resolution 45, 2022, resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving an amendment to the PGA National Commerce Park Plan Unit Development, PUD, to allow the development of a 36,360 square foot office building, a 50,022 square foot warehouse industrial building, and site improvements on lots five, six, seven, and eight, together being the subject site, as well as modifications to the PGA National Commerce Park Development Guidelines. The subject site is approximately 20.05 acres and is located on Hyatt Drive at the northwest corner of North Lake Boulevard and the Florida's Turnpike within the PGA National Plan Community Development PCD, as more particularly described herein, providing waivers, providing conditions of approval, providing an effective date and further purposes. Thank you so much, Patty. You do that so well. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I will be opening the hearing. I'm going to start by asking if any uh, council members need to declare ex parte on resolution 45 of 2022. Negative. Negative, none. Just drove through the property the other day. Absolutely, thank you very much. If you filled out a card, we'll be getting to you after the presentation, just so you know. And if we could have the presentation, please. All right. Good evening, my name is Rob Dinsmore with Urban Design Studio. Uh, I am one of the aforementioned, I have been sworn in, thank you, sorry. Uh, 16 Clematis Street, West Palm Beach, 33401. I'm one of the aforementioned uh, colleagues of Senator Bobby Powell Jr., and he was far more charismatic this evening than I have seen him on a daily basis. So that was interesting. Can't wait to discuss that. Um, I'm here on behalf of the applicant LRP Publications, LRP Properties LLC, and LLP Properties, LRP Properties uh, 2 LLC to present a PUD amendment to the PGA National Commerce Park PUD. Uh, the PGA National Commerce Park PUD is a 33 acre, eight lot parcel in the very southeast corner of the PGA National PCD, directly west of the Florida Turnpike, just north of North Lake Boulevard, with direct access to North Lake Boulevard from Hyatt Drive. The specific rest before, request before you this evening is for a 20.5 acre, three lot parcel of that PUD uh, to allow for the development of two additional buildings and associated site modifications. Included with this approval or request is the approval of revisions to the design guidelines uh, for the Commerce Park, as well as one waiver request to allow for existing nonconformities on the site to remain. The land use for the site is industrial with a bioscience research protection overlay. This will remain unchanged. Current zoning on the site is the PCD, PUD, with an M1, uh, underlying M1. Again, this will also remain unchanged. The existing conditions of the site include four existing buildings, parking, site improvements associated with those buildings and uses, uh, mature vegetation in all of the surrounding landscape buffers, um, and then lot six is mostly vacant as well as the northern portion of lot five, which is surface parking. Those two portions will be the primary focus of the proposed uh, plan of development. The four buildings that exist on the site today include a three-story office building at the south end of lot four, or lot five, excuse me, which is the headquarters of LRP. It is 61,200 uh, square feet. 
uh, building four, an industrial uh, building with ancillary office, 61,200 square feet, a single story building. And just south of that, two additional office buildings. All three of these buildings are on lots seven and eight. Uh, building five is a single story office building of about 26,000 square feet. Building six is a two story office building of about uh, 37,500 square feet. The subject site is actually currently approved as two separate site plans. Uh, the request with this approval would be to join those under one site plan. As part of that, the applicant will be recording a unity of title over the property to join those under a common ownership, as well as a unity of control to allow for the shared access to and maintenance of those shared elements, uh, such as the access points, the driveways, uh, utilities, the drainage um, elements, that sort of thing. Lot seven and eight is fully built out as it is currently approved uh, for a total intensity of 124,824 square feet. Lots five and six are currently approved for three buildings, only one of which is currently constructed. That's building one that I mentioned previously. Uh, building two is currently approved as an additional 62,000 worth of office in a three-story building, kind of a sister building to building one. Building three is also approved as a single story warehouse building of an additional 45,100 square feet. The total intensity as it's currently approved for all three lots is 293,303 square feet. Uh, the proposed plan of development is consistent with the current approved plan and that it does uh, call for or show uh, two additional buildings to be built on site, one an office, one an industrial warehouse building. However, building two is being reduced from three stories to two stories for a total square footage of 36,360. Building three will uh, continue to be a single story warehouse building of 50,022 square feet. The total intensity for this proposed plan of development for the overall site is 272,442 square feet. That's a net reduction in to the current approved plan of 20, almost 21,000 square feet. Uh, which would result in a reduction in 169 daily trips as compared to the current approved plan. The integration of the two properties under one site plan really allows us some flexibility and the opportunity to make some design changes that are beneficial visually and functionally to the site as a whole. Um, one of the big things that's, uh, that we're gonna be doing is removing the requirement for that 10 foot buffer between these two properties. Uh, we're not completely removing all of that landscape material. You can see in this graphic that the northern portion, the southern portion of that buffer uh, will remain as landscape area and some of that mature vegetation that's in that area will also remain. We're also proposing multiple points of vehicular and pedestrian cross access. Again, this really does improve the circulation, the functionality of the site as a whole. Uh, as I mentioned, building two, the proposed office building is being reduced in height. And we're also reorienting that towards the Western property line of lots uh, five and six. And this is going to allow for creation of more of a campus like feel between office building five and two. Uh, I'll touch on this in a later slide of why we're making that decision and some of the other benefits that are coming along with that. Another uh, change that is being made is to reorient the loading bay and the truck port area associated with that warehouse building to the south side of that building that really offers twofold worth of benefits one from a functional standpoint it aligns it and allows it to function better with the existing truck board of, of building four just to the west so that functionality is going to be much more improved the second benefit is to the impact of the neighbors to the north as currently approved that warehouse building allocates its truck board its loading bays on the north side so to minimize that impact, we've redesigned that to be on the south side of that building, allowing for more separation from those uses. Some other improvements on the site that are worth noting at this time, uh, development of a courtyard space between those office buildings along with a covered uh, walkway connecting the two buildings. We will be um, installing four dual plug electric vehicle charging stations to service four parking spaces on the north side of building two as well as providing for a space for public art installation uh, to be in accordance with the city's art and public places um, code. Uh, this piece would be located at the very southern end of the courtyard space 
and then northern terminus of one of the main entry drives to the to the property. So really creating kind of an impact entry feature uh, to to the property. The landscape buffers around the property, there's a substantial amount of mature vegetation that exists today. None of that mature vegetation within the buffers was proposed to be removed. That will all stay. We are proposing some enhancements to the northern buffer along lots five and six, which is directly adjacent to our affected area of that new building. Uh, we're going to be supplementing that existing material with additional understory planting in the form of shrubs, uh, mid-level planting in the form of accents, small canopy trees as well as where we do have that mature canopy that exists today, there are some gaps or spaces in those trees and we're gonna be filling those in with groupings of flash pines uh, to take what the current uh, condition of approval on the property requires to be a 75% opaque vegetative uh, kind of buffer there. We're gonna lean that more towards 100%. And so that's one of the improvements that we came to agreement with staff through our, through our review process of the plans. One additional item to note on this that's kind of popped up over the last week. The applicant has been contacted by the property manager for the PGA Property Owners Association. She has received communication from some neighbors, residential neighbors to the north, that they had concerns with the existing condition of the northern buffer associated with lots seven and eight. Uh, we were unaware of this prior to this week, but now that we've been informed, the applicant has been in contact with the property manager and has communicated with me uh, that it is their intent to be a good neighbor and they will work to make improvements that the neighbors wish to see in that area uh, to make sure that everybody's happy. I mean, they have no intent of being anything but a good neighbor, so just wanted to point that out. We might hear about that uh, after my presentation. Uh, the main reason or the driver behind this campus-like feel that I've mentioned a couple of times before is uh, Excellus, which is formerly Integrity Implants. Uh, became Excellus in uh, July of 2021 after they merged with Fusion Robotics. They are a uh, medical device implant research development uh, company that currently leases uh, the majority of Building 5 office space now. They do intend to relocate their headquarters to Palm Beach Gardens and in particular to the PGA uh, Commerce Park. Their ultimate goal is to grow from about 80 employees to about upwards of 140. They plan to lease out the, the entirety of Building 5, as I mentioned. They will lease out the entire office space of Building 2 and lease the majority or a large portion of the warehouse space in Building 3 uh, for their production and distribution facility. And so the jobs that will be associated with this are uh, all of the existing employees, uh, corporate executives, accounting staff, human resources, professionals, uh, medical device salespeople, uh, manufacturing employees. So these are, these are good jobs and this is kind of a, a big win and obviously a big driver of why we're making these improvements and we've worked closely with them to ensure that you know, we're making improvements that will suit their needs. This is an architectural rendering of the proposed office building, Building 2. This is looking from the southeast corner of the building, looking northwest. Um, you know, the architect designed the buildings to be consistent as much as he could with the existing buildings on site today, the same materials, colors, that sort of thing. I really worked to break up the building massing with the variation in colors, the use of the aluminum awnings, canopies, uh, changes in material colors, uh, the recesses and projections of the buildings, the parapet shifts, uh, really did a nice job to kind of create some dynamics in that architectural uh, features. And you can see that these are the elevations of that same building. You can really start to see the parapet returns, the differentiation of colors, and the glazing, how it creates character in the building. This is the architect's rendering of the courtyard space between building five and building two. You can see in the background the aluminum covering that is over the walkway connecting the two office buildings, so they kind of are, are functioning as one. Uh, the space in the very front, the, the concrete paved area is where we intend to place the public art piece. Uh, it hasn't been designed yet, hasn't been commissioned, so it's not on these renderings, uh, but that is where it's intended to go to act as an anchor for this public space. Um, and then the space itself seems very open and that is by intention, by design. Excellus, as part of their business practice, likes to host events and um, gatherings with doctors, with people who are gonna use their devices 
so they can explain how they function. And it's a very social aspect of what they do. They like to have a space that's flexible where they can set up tents, they can set up tables and hold these kind of events. Outside of that, they are also big on offering social activities for their employees. They do a monthly, what they call Friday at four, where they'll set up tents and tables and ping pong tables and cornhole tables. And it's a kind of a little getaway for the employees, if you will. So their intent of this space is for it to be daily usable and flexible at the same time. This is the architectural rendering for building three, which is the warehouse building on the north. Again, looking from the northeast corner towards the southwest, it is consistent with a lot of the same architectural features I mentioned about the office building and color and materials, similarly with the elevations. As I mentioned at the very beginning, part of our request is approval of revisions to the design guidelines for the PGA National Commerce Park. They were adopted in January 1987. They were revised one time in October of 1987 and have not been touched since then. And so some of the revisions that are being made are to bring some of the elements more in line with what city code, consistency with city code as far as building height, light pole height. Uh, that one in particular, we're also trying to bring things consistent with what's actually built on site, <laughs> not just what's in the city code, um, and a few minor modifications to the sign allowance. All of these revisions have been reviewed previously and approved by the PGA National Property Owners Association Architectural Review Committee, as well as the PGA National Commerce Park Association. So everybody's reviewed them and, and approved them up to this point. The last element of our request is the one waiver that I mentioned at the beginning, and this is to allow for an existing nonconformity on the site to remain as is. City code requires that you have a landscape island every nine parking spaces, and that island be at least five feet wide. We have eight locations on site where there are 10 parking spaces in a row before an island is provided. All the islands on site are a minimum of five feet. Most of them are wider than that. Uh, one of the main reasons we wanna keep this in place, uh, there is a substantial amount of mature vegetation on the site, as I mentioned. All of these islands have large oak trees in them, and the risk of transplant or disruption of those root systems to remedy this uh, is a risk that we'd rather not take. Um, but so it's just to allow this existing condition to remain as is. As a summary of the request, we have the approval of the PUD amendment to allow the two new buildings and the site improvements, the revisions to the design guidelines, and the one waiver to allow that existing nonconformity to remain. We do have staff recommendation of approval for all of those requests, and the applicant has reviewed and agrees to all of the current conditions of approval as written. Excellent, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, do we have a staff presentation this evening? Uh, no, Madam Mayor, the applicant was very thorough. Okay. Staff is recommending approval, including the waiver, and we are happy to answer any questions from the council. I do want to note that uh, in your packets, oh, there was a uh, letter from the PGA National Commerce Park, POA letter of support. There is also a letter of support uh, from the master of PGA National as well that has issued support in addition to the BDB sanctioned letter, which is included in your packet. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, I appreciate that. All right, I do have a couple of, actually I have three comment cards. So I'm going to call your name, and when I do, if you could come to the uh, podium and state your name and address. So I'll start with Ms. Michelle Composto, and I apologize for anyone's names I get wrong tonight. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. My name is Michelle Composto, oh, I'm and so sorry. I live at 16H Lexington Lane West. Um, and I you've been sworn in. I apologize for yes. interrupting. Thank you. Um, I only know about the development because I received a certified letter in the mail because of my proximity to the development. Uh, I, I, I was really upset by it. And, you know, I lived in this city for over 40 years, and I planned to live here for the rest of my days. And um, it's really starting to get out of control. What is the planned remedy for traffic congestion between Beeline and military? It doesn't seem like a sound decision to approve any further development until the remedy is implemented. The current approval of this project was over 35 years ago. The area has changed significantly and the changes that have been approved by the city since have created this traffic congestion between Beeline and military with no known remedy. When 
This development was approved 35 plus years ago. There were cows where Christ Fellowship now sits. Nothing in this area is the same. The development affects everyone in PGA National who use the North Lake entrance, not just Lexington Green and Cypress. This affects everyone, period, that uses North Lake between Beeline and military, not just PGA National residents. I request you not approve this development until all the owners of PGA National and the surrounding area are notified in writing and can voice their concerns. The approval shouldn't take place in the summer when many residents are out of town. It should occur during the winter months when everyone is in residence. No further should development should be approved until the traffic congestion between the B line and military is remedied. When I just listened to this presentation and he talked about how they want to entertain, um, the tenant wants to entertain doctors and people and parties, I mean, that's even more congestion besides the actual employees that'll be there. I, I just, I don't get it. I, I, I really, that's, I don't get it. I don't know where you're, you're going with this and why you continue the approval without the known remedy. So I ask, slow your roll and start considering about the remedy of the traffic congestion before you approve one more thing in the area between Beeline and military on North Lake. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I'd like to call up Ms. Mindy Logue, please, if you could come up and state your name and address, please. Take your time. Okay. And Ms. Logue, you have been sworn in. Thank you. As you know, my name is Mindy Logue. I live at 10D Lexington Lane East. My unit is directly across from Commerce Park. The landscape has never been adequate. I have always had the unpleasant view across the water. I'm not thrilled about additional buildings going up there. Promises of adequate la landscape are never kept. I am also concerned about the additional traffic on North Lake and think that this isn't a good time for additional development to take place. We don't know the full impact on traffic congestion on North Lake until Avenir and other developments west of the B-Line are completed. I request that you do not approve any additional development until traffic congestion is remedied. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I'd like to call Mr. Tony, and I will get this wrong, Tony Pajoran, please. If you could state your name, address. And you have been sworn in. Thank you. My name is Tony Pajunin. I live at 25 Lexington Lane West, apartment H. And I also uh, second what the previous two ladies have said about the congestion. We all know Florida has a lot of traffic as it is, and it's getting worse every single day. We cannot have more cars without a remedy for the Beeline Highway issue. So really take this seriously, because that, that's a huge, huge complex with lots and lots and lots of more cars in an already congested area. And if we don't have something to do um, about that, it's just going to end up becoming a big mess. So I highly, highly uh, request you to please um, not do this until you really have thought about what are we going to do with all those extra cars? Because it's not just going to be those cars. People are moving into the state every single day um, by the thousands, you know, every single year. So we just have to think about that. Um, and please do not move forward with this until you have. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. All right. With that, I will actually be closing the hearing. May I get a second, a motion and a second to approve, please? I'll make a motion to approve Resolution 45-2022. Second. 
Thank you. All right, it's been moved and seconded that Resolution 45 is on the floor and open for discussion. Mark, since you moved, why don't you go ahead and begin so we can have a discussion. Um, I, I understand and respect the comments of the neighbors. Um, this is something that we all think and talk about on a regular basis. There's been numerous conversations about every project, about every thing that is coming to our region because it is a growing area. We live in a very desirable place and the secret is definitely out that Northern Palm Beach County is the place to be. I think COVID really kind of showed that, but we have to kind of balance the, the needs of our current residents. And I do live in PJ National and I drive by that intersection um, three days a week as I head south to my office on Okeechobee Boulevard. I take the turnpike there. So I am very familiar with that spot. Uh, but we also have to recognize the need and the, the value of economic development. The nice thing about this particular project is it is professional space. There's no restaurants. There's no garbage dumpsters. The applicant made a uh, made the, con the, the conscientious move of moving the loading docks to the south side of the building so that there won't be any um, noise or debris that you'll find floating around. Uh, we've watched uh, the applicants and their planners uh, bring projects to the city and whenever and our staff are very very good at making sure that they are held to the standard that the city of Palm Beach Gardens has set a long time ago making sure that the neighbors uh, the um, the uh, buffering is is correct and proper making sure that the landscaping is done uh, to a to a to a level that is far beyond what you'll find in many other municipalities in and around us so uh, I'm going to approve this project because I think it's the best thing for that area. It's already been approved for economic development. We pride ourselves as a city and a region of bringing these types of businesses and these types of corporate partners to our area, and they're going to be a good partner for us. They're already there. They're just expanding their footprint. So uh, I appreciate the comments. I thank the, the applicant for making the necessary changes to the area, and I'm going to approve. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I'm, I'm going to go with the PJ National contingent first. Um, I'd like to ask Natalie and Ken to address the traffic, the co concurrency studies that were done, uh, what the plans are for North Lake and how this project actually has a smaller footprint than what was originally approved. Yes, ma'am. I would be happy to address that. And uh, I'm going to ask Ms. Maroney to pull up the slide that shows the, the trip. Do we have that? Because that might help some of the residents better understand. Because it is important to note that this is an existing project with existing buildings that are approved on it that were never constructed, that the applicant uh, has, they have vested entitlements, they have vested rights. And what this, what this particular project has done is that they have taken that vested square footage and they have reduced it. There is 293,000, just a little over 293,000 square feet that is approved with this development that they could pull today. They could construct that square footage today. And under that development order, the loading docks face north and there is no additional uh, landscaping requirements that has been provided with, with this site plan. So as part of this plan, uh, it has been very intentionally designed to be uh, more accommodating to the residents to the immediate north, which is uh, Cypress, but all of the uh, Cypress Point, but all of the residents to the north do benefit. Um, there is no illumination with the signage. There is additional landscaping. The loading docks are to the south, and there's square footage, notably as it as it addresses the traffic qu questions, um, is less. So there are there are less projected trips. Um, there is a total square footage reduction of over 20,000 square feet. Um, so in terms of the proposed traffic, the traffic study demonstrates that those numbers are less than the approved uh, vested improvements. Thank you. What would be the means to make sure all of that landscaping goes in as promised? I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the things I had asked at my agenda review was what about filling in on lot seven and eight uh, where the buffer's a little thin. How do we ensure uh, that that gets done? Well, wh what we have going on right now is we have two different development orders. There is a separate development order for lots seven and eight, which requires the 75% opaque screening, which the applicant referred to. And I think you heard loud, loud and clear 
that the applicant is willing to exceed that standard, supplement the buffer, and is willing to do so. If it is not addressed, um, the remedy would be through the city's code enforcement department, which we are well aware of this now that this issue has been brought up and we can take action if necessary. This particular development order, all of the landscaping and uh, the certification of the building and the, uh, the, the CO sign-off process will ensure that all the supplemental landscaping will be in place prior to the issuance of the CO. There's a surety that's posted to ensure, with like every development project that is posted, to ensure that that landscaping is maintained. And then, of course, you have the city's code enforcement pro uh, process, which ensures the integrity of the buffer. And uh, all of these things we, we, we do regularly within the city's development process. So we will ensure that those landscape standards will be maintained. Thank you. Ken, could you come up and put the slide up with the buildings and the little yellow dot for our charging stations, please? <laughs> You'll get the third one in a few minutes. And I think, yeah, one of those has the dot on it where it shows the charging station. Okay. So there are four charging stations to serve eight vehicles by building two. Right. Building three is the larger building and there are none. The existing buildings, does five, one, and six, do they have any charging stations? Not currently proposed. Okay, you're talking about entertaining doctors. This is a tech company. I don't know a doctor who doesn't have a car that requires a charging station right now. What can we do to increase the numbers? We're, we're allowing more spaces between the poles on the waiver. How can we get more distributed charging stations through the property? Uh, good, good evening, Ken Sumo with Urban Design Studio. My address is 610 Clamata Street, West Palm Beach. I've been sworn in. I'm gonna address building number three, Vice Mayor, because you brought that up. Building number three is not an office building. It is a just, it is a, a more of a warehouse facility. So electrical charging probably doesn't work there because it'd be semis backing up and doing their thing in that area. In regards to building number two, where we've proposed the, the eight electric charging stations, I'm gonna turn around here and see what uh, our clients wanna do on that matter. But we believe that because it's a 34,000 square foot or 36,000 square foot office building, that's been added that the eight stations will serve those, those, those folks in a significant way. But there's a connection between that building and building five, correct? That's all part of, and there's none by building five? Right, well I need to address, I need to understand and I'm gonna have to turn around to manual because I apologize, I do not know, does the office remain in building five in manual or does it all shift to You'll have, to, you'll have to come up here, Emmanuel. I apologize. From a use standpoint, not necessarily from an approval standpoint. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. Have um, you been sworn in, sir? If you could say your, your name and your address and that you've been sworn in or not. Emmanuel Kotronakis, 450 Old Town Lane, Juno Beach, and I have been sworn, sworn in. Thank you. Um, the tenant um, has a, a mixed use in build, building five. They plan on moving the corporate offices and some of the, the sales function um, into building five and do more of the, uh, the theater and uh, the research and development and some manufacturing in, in building five, the, the flex space. So, the, you know, I would say half of the occupants currently in building five are gonna move over to building two and then some of the relocated uh, corporate staff from um, California and um, Colorado will be also moving into building two. Um, as far as the, the current demand, you know, I, we've been um, trying to meet the, the you know, this, this development, is, the genesis of the, this development is to serve the needs of our existing tenants. Um, and so that's where the, you know, the, the campus space in between the, um, the two buildings uh, comes from. Um, we asked about uh, any other amenities. Um, charging stations didn't come up. Um, when, uh, when, when the staff um, insisted that, uh, that we include that to kind of future proof the building, 
we said, okay. So we asked the, the tenant where, uh, you know, how many would you, would you like, where, where would you need them? And they're like, well, we, we, we don't really see a, a demand for it, but, uh, you know, try to keep it out of the way. So, uh, you know, I think we're demands of the tenant um, with the uh, uh, proposed uh, charging stations. Um, you know, short of that, I, I, don't, I don't know what, uh, what problem we're try, trying to solve. Good evening, Ken Tim with Urban Design Studio. We will add one more charging station, which will be two spots. It's a total of nine, or a total of 10, sorry, ten total spots. 10 spots. Well, 10 spots for 100, but we're gonna have 140 employees in that building between the two. It's Carl. Right ahead, Carl. Carl. Go right ahead. I, I will turn oh, my comments see. over to Carl. To yes, Carl, please go ahead. I like what, go ahead. On that one, because I like where you're going. Well, I'm going to support Rochelle in this, this uh, topic on charging stations. So what kind are they and how fast do they charge and how many vehicles can we service so we're addressing a problem before there's a problem? And because there's going to be more electric vehicles, there's probably several up here. Probably most of you guys have electric vehicles. One, two, three. I don't have electric vehicles. You have a hybrid, right? Are I drive hybrid? a Chevy Tahoe. I don't charge my car. I, have, huh? I work in a 100,000 square foot office building. We have one charging station, and there's uh, a car in it, I would say, probably most of the time. Um, but there are also opportunities where it's empty, and that's a 100,000 so, square feet office. So, Ken, you know as well as in all of us, this is the direction the city's going. You know, the more electric vehicles we get, the more we need to service them, the more we may not want someone to park in it all day, maybe get their car charged and let somebody else move. So what kind of chargers are these? These are the Type 2 chargers, and I might get my terminology mixed up. They're Type 2 chargers. I forget, too. Recognizing that this is also an office building, so people will be coming in, plugging and parking there for the course of the day. That's the reason why we chose the Type 2 chargers. Is that the slower one? Well, there's three levels. And look, I'm outside my pay grade. I, you know, yeah, so I get I, it. So there's a super duper charger, there's a, a regular one, and then there's a the middle of the road. We're in the middle of the road, which is so, consistent for office buildings because it only charges in for probably in about eight hours versus a supercharger, which doesn't like, I don't have an electric car, but it's like an hour. Yeah, is, is there a possibility, a, a way, okay, so five is definitely better than four. So we will I'll be happy with that to make sure the infrastructure is there should the need ar arise later for is that is that infrastructure so of making sure that the transformer is sized appropriately and the conduit is in place for future expansion for future expansion of the number of charging stations yeah. um, we also did that when we built uh, buildings uh, five and uh, six so we have conduit in place in front of uh, building six to prepare for that uh, you know, the, the okay. eventuality. Okay, then we will be happy with the, I will be happy with the additional charging station. Thank you. All right, I am waiting for Mercy, I believe. Carl, is there anything else you wanna add? I'll go after Mercy, I just okay. want to I understand. the charging topic while you can go. Not, and then I can move on from it. You might as well go ahead. Okay, so uh, Rob, how many employees does this place have? And how many people are gonna be coming and going roughly? Uh, currently 80 employees at the moment with the goal to expand to 140. Uh, coming and going, I think they're pretty much there a typical work day, so I don't know that there's much in and out of the facility. So the good thing is it's not really a, like a traffic attractor. So um, just speaking to our constituents and our, our residents here, um, you have no idea how hypersensitive this council is to traffic and how many meetings we go to with Florida Department of Transportation and the traffic on the alternate as it merges onto 95 and the interchange at North Lake 
and how we're going to deal with traffic at PGA and the trail and how it merges onto I-95 southbound from eastbound PGA and what's going on with our traffic signals and how they communicate with other traffic signals so we can keep stuff going, as you can tell. So there is going to be an interchange at the B line. I think it's still in progress, right, Natalie? It's moving on with DOT that, or was it on hold? It's. No, I, the, the proposed interchange yeah. with DOT and at North Lake and the B line is, is, is absolutely moving yeah, forward. Yeah, I wanted to make sure I didn't speak out of turn on that. So there is a remedy for moving the traffic more efficiently on North Lake, but um, and we are careful and we're sensitive, but this is a good project and this is a, uh, a not a high density um, traffic where, where, you know, so there are going to be tons of people coming and going. It's good for the community, and um, and I am going to support it, but we want to make sure you guys know that we're very careful on every vote we make and everything that puts a nail into the city. So it's already an industrial area, and you're tucked away in there where it's perfect for some warehouse. And there was conversation brought up that I had the other day um, to make sure that we're sensitive to the landscape and the the height of the berm with the landscaping. So the whether it's Cypress or Lexington or wherever you guys live, uh, there will be a height and a noise buffer. So um, you guys shouldn't be a victim or or be bothered by the traffic that's going to be moving in there. So um, I think that's all I had. I, I like the. I like the charging station thing because that's where we're going. We all know that's always going to be a thing, and and I'm I'm good I'm good with it. Um, Rob, so another thing that I brought up um, here you, with my fellow council members, I'm usually the big mouth on the art and public places. So even though sometimes I say it ahead of time, I'm always going to push art and public places. Um, so Ken, you know, with projects going forward. That, that I'm already going to be there, or I might have a little bit of a problem with it. We don't need the money on, in our AIIP board, our fund. So I appreciate you bringing that up. So do it right, sir. Sure. So for, the, uh, for our last project with buildings uh, five and six, we um, commissioned Peter Garage uh, to build the Hand of Time. Uh, we have commissioned him for the next piece uh, that, that's going to be in the spot right between buildings five and uh, building two. So, you know, we're, we're excited about it. The, uh, the CEO of the uh, tenant um, is really excited about it, participating in the design process. So that's underway. We have some concepts. And so we, 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 uh, we really liked how the, uh, the art brought our, our First project, uh, you know, together, um, and uh, we we hope to do the same thing with uh, with this one. Well, I'm good with that, Mayor. Thank you. And um, I bring the art and public's places up is because it's it's a it's good for the community. And I know you're tucked away back there, but you know people will appreciate it. And and I'm going to support it, and I like it. And you guys are are uh, welcome to the city. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Marcy. Thank you. Um, I'll start by saying thank you for bringing up your concerns and um, I appreciate you being here and, and voicing them for sure. And uh, I agree with um, Carl, that was well said. Um, you know, we do take traffic very seriously. It is probably the most important thing and that's the one thing that every resident is always concerned about as, as we are. We live here, we work here, and we travel on the same roads and are just, just as frustrated. Um, we have met um, and talked and listened to DOT's, uh, um, their uh, suggestions and what they're doing for uh, Beeline and North Lake, as Carl mentioned, and they are planning to move forward with that along with other, um, other roads, obviously. Uh, those right of, rights of way are not uh, in our jurisdiction, but we still uh, work as hard as we possibly can to encourage that the infrastructure is there for all of our residents. Um, and so with that said, this development, um, as Natalie pointed out, is actually a reduction in their already approved 
vesting of square footage. So while they could be building a, a 20,000, almost 21,000 more square feet, they're actually reducing that, which is a 2,000 and change cars less on the road than what they're already allowed to build. So um, that is why um, you know, we are in favor of it. If they were asking for more trips, that would be a whole nother story. We would be considering that, and I know Natalie and her team would be really uh, looking very seriously at, at that if that were the case, but it's not. And um, I do appreciate the applicant uh, taking the landscape uh, questions and concerns seriously and addressing them and making sure that the property manager m managers uh, for the other portions uh, will do the same for the areas that uh, you're not responsible for to make sure that they um, address those concerns uh, going forward and also in, in the maintenance world as well um, because obviously landscape dies over time just like us. We all have lifespans and so does landscape. So. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you gotta <laughs> fix it, <laughs> replace it. But um, you know, we expect you to do that. So thank you um, for doing that. And uh, uh, again, uh, I appreciate you bringing your uh, concerns to us, and, and I, I can empathize as well, 100. percent Thank you, Marcia. Anybody else? No. Well, um, I'm I'm pretty much a lifelong resident here. This actual building we're sitting in used to be a pile of dirt where we used to look for dinosaur bones when I was a kid. Um, I would ride my bike right here, and Burns Road is where I used to feed my favorite horse carrots and sugar cubes. I get it. I know what you're experiencing, um, but I will assure you that our staff is primarily residents. This council, we're all residents and have deep, deep ties here. Every single trip every single building we really, really think about and our staff advocates for developers who have vested rights to build here, to reduce the size of it, to reduce trips. These folks are saving oak trees. They built their parking lot around the existing trees. I think that's a, a vote of confidence in their favor as well. They're gonna do everything they can to be good neighbors. Something's gonna go there. It is zoned for it and they have vested rights to it. This is a good project, and I understand your concern. It's been here a lot longer than this council has as well. So it, it's, uh, I think it is a good project. I appreciate you guys saying you'll be good neighbors and follow through with the landscaping, and I know our staff will be watching to make sure in this council as well. So that said, I'm going to close the hearing. Can I get a motion and a second? Oh, I did that. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0, thank you very much. Moving on to resolution 46, 2022. If I could please have the clerk read the title. Resolution 46, 2022, a resolution in the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, granting site plan major conditional use and minor conditional use approval for a 376,759 square foot commercial retail development on approximately 51.55 acres within the town center district, parcel B, of the Avenir Plan Community Development PCD Master Plan, which is generally located on the north side of North Lake Boulevard, east of Coconut Boulevard, and west of Avenir Drive, is more particularly described herein, providing conditions of approval, providing waivers, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. All right, thank you again, Patty, we appreciate it. I'm going to open the hearing. And we're going to start ex parte very slowly. So, because we have, we're out one, Marcy. I'll ex parte. Um, I have in the past spoke with um, the applicant, uh, Rosa, Danny, Manny, Tanya, um, and on numerous occasions in regards to their overall project and this one as well. Thank you, Mark. Same, nothing specific about the particular project we see before us, but general conversations about the town center with the applicants in the past. Thank you, Carl. I guess I would have to be the same, but nothing specific to anything in this particular project, just over general conversations. All right, I'll go first while we wait for Rochelle. Um, I do have ex parte with Rosa and Tanya on July 21st and July 28th. The subject was not discussed in specific. And Rochelle, do you have any ex parte? Amazingly, no. I did not talk to anyone on this project. Excellent. All right. Thank you. May I please have the presentation? Hi, Ken. Hi. 
Good. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good, good evening, Ken Tum with Urban Design Studio. I'm third in a row, Mr. Woods, and I'll probably be 20 minutes this evening because this is a significant project, I know. But, but, but I'm gonna walk through about 30 slides this evening. Thanks, and what you have in front of you this evening, I have been sworn in, by the way, my address is 610 Clematis Street. What you have in front of you this evening is a collaboration that has occurred over many years. This project has been in the process, I got, gosh, I bet for four years, I don't know exactly. But it's been a collaboration working with your staff, trying to come to a plan that makes sense for your staff, for our clients, for the residents of Avenir. There are significant residents in Avenir now. And then also, finally, the tenants. It has taken a long time to get to where we are today, but it's a plan that I think that if you approve tonight that you'll be proud to have within the city of Palm Beach Gardens. The key design concept between for this plan was to create a vibrant town center. And that vibrant town center involves pedestrian activity, golf cart activity, because we're in Avenir and there are golf carts all over Avenir to create connectivity through that, and also vehicular connections too, because we want to make sure people come. This is just not to serve the residents of Avenir, it will serve the surrounding residents also, including Ibis and the acreage area. So I'm gonna walk you through about 20 to five to 30 slides. I'll do it fairly quickly, but I am gonna go through a couple key items. First on the screen in front of you is the location of the site. It's the town center site. That entire site that's on the screen is about 84 acres. There are really three phases in this project. What's in front of you this evening are two phases. The third phase, which is the townhomes, uh, will be submitted tomorrow to the city of Palm Beach Gardens for their second review, letting you know you'll be getting some paper tomorrow. Uh, so that will be submitted tomorrow. So that process is moving forward also, and I hope to bring that in front of you by the end of this year, but we'll see where we go as I work our way through the comments. So you're familiar with the site. The requests that are actually in front of you, there are several. First is site plan approval for phase one and phase two, which are commercial and office and retail buildings. Phase one and phase two, and I'll get into detail why we have a phase one and phase two in a little bit. It's a total of 376,000 square feet. Of that, 120,000 square feet is office square footage. There's also approval of the request is to approve the PCB entry feature, which is located at the corner of Coconut and North Lake Boulevard. So we'll have nice entry features similar to what is east on the Avenir entranceway. There are other minor, there are other approvals associated with kind of this, this master plan, including outdoor display area. We have a grocery store, it's green, and they have some outdoor display area. There's also a major conditional use to allow a drugstore with a drive-through pharmacy, similar to a CVS or a Walgreens and then a minor conditional use which is required because the grocery store Publix is looking to have a drive-through for its pharmacy. Very similar to what you see at Alton today where there's a drive-through in that pharmacy. And then finally, there's a series of waivers. Those weird waivers are really in two chunks. The first chunk is about some of the request changes to design guidelines. And the second chunk are really signage requirements. The signage code within the city, which, the, which defaults here, doesn't necessarily work for the mixed use projects because the buildings are a little further set back. Again, consistent with what you've seen at Alton and the other mixed use centers in the, in the, in the city. So the development site that is in front of you this evening is 51.37 acres. It's uh, 346,000 square feet, a mix of retail, restaurants, groceries, drugstores, office, hotel, and outdoor seating areas. I'm gonna walk you through the site plan real quick and then I'm gonna go through details. To the south down here on the bottom is North Lake Boulevard. To the west is Coconut. This is the extension of Coconut as you go into the acreage to the south and to the north you come into the roundabout. The Coconut Road extension is practically constructed today. Avenir has been moving forward in constructing that in deep, in constructing that, in fact, the landscape is going in and the whole area is getting constructed. So the next part about the site plan is kind of the framework of streets. It's part of the requirement of design guidelines. As you go down the middle, this street right here is called the Premier Street or the Main Street. The requirements of the Main Street require you to bring the buildings closer to the road, not have parking along the, along, along the uh, not have uh, parking in front of the building. However, uh, parallel parking is allowed. And then there is, uh, these are retail. So as you pull in, you'll see retail on both sides, smaller centers with outdoor restaurants. And you pull down the main street, immediately you'll notice these two buildings. And then there's large public gathering areas, which I'll show you details in a little bit. 
the idea was to kind of energize a center in these open spaces that are surrounding these buildings. Uh, to give you a frame of reference, as you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about Alton because it's the most recent approval and you're familiar with it. When you go by the restaurants in Alton, there's that large open space. That's kind of a similar design of what this is. And then you immediately continue further north on the main road. And then these buildings, 19, 20, 22, and 20, which are in phase two, are office buildings. So those will come in an office building. So the idea is to have the office buildings further north. And then finally, the main road will terminate onto the future townhomes that will be coming in front of you, hopefully later this year. The idea is to create pedestrian connectivity between all of those. Now, as you look at the center on the other side, here you'll see a grocery, excuse me, here you'll see a um, pharmacy. And then this is a grocery store and the associated uses that go along with a grocery store, including restaurant spaces. Immediately to the east, again, part of phase two, these set of buildings will be retail and restaurant also. So let me walk you through a little bit of detail. I just wanted to give you the quick overview of what's happening. So as I said, three phases. The first two phases are in front of you tonight. Phase one is buildings one through eight. This is a Publix. And building one through eight ending here uh, on the right-hand side of the main entrance. All those buildings are part of phase one. The request for the tonight is both a site plan approval and architectural approvals for those. For phase two, identified in red, we're requesting approval of the excuse me, we're requesting approval of the horizontal site plan, but the buildings will come back before you in the future when we know more what that's going to come to be. It'll be consistent in design of the other buildings, but at this point in time, the architecture is not complete. However, the square footage is there. So the reason why that's important is because it sets up the grid and a network of streets. So in the future, when those office buildings come online, they'll be consistent with the way that the road network is set up. The final phase, which is the third phase, which I said a little bit earlier, completely separate site plan and approvals and that hopefully will come to you later this year. Um, so I started talking about design standards. I'm not gonna walk you through how many pages they are, but those design guidelines set up the criteria for the road network, they set up the criteria for the sidewalks, the form of architecture and all the design regulations that's made Avenir so successful um, since its approval in 2016. So key, key concepts here, vehicular and pedestrian connections. I'm gonna spend some time talking about vehicular connections first and I'll talk about pedestrian connections. So the vehicular connections are on the screen in front of you here. So there are, this network of streets is really important. The premier street that goes down the middle that's a full intersection, and I'll show you that it will have a signal on it, but it, this is a full intersection here, and this Premier Street is a street that has on-street parking on both sides. It then has an eight-foot sidewalk, and then it has eating areas, so it's creating that real walkability. The next series of street are the pink streets. Those are the primary streets. Those primary streets are important transportation corridors, but they also serve a purpose by allowing separation of parking. So those transportation corridors along the east side, there is an eight foot sidewalk on one side, a 12 foot sidewalk on the other side, keeping that consistent with the avenue theme that you see going down the spine road where it's an eight foot sidewalk on one side, a 12 foot sidewalk on the other to have golf cart connectivity, pedestrian activity, bikes and running. So the roads in pink are those are the primary roads. The next set of roads in blue are the secondary roads. These are the roads that parking shows up on the secondary road, and that's part of the design concept with the Avenue Town Center. With the Avenue Town Center is the way it works is the road network sets up the landscape buffering. So the landscape buffering here is less. The parking spaces get a little closer. The, the sidewalks on both sides of those blue roads are five feet wide, and then there's, a, then there's a hedge on both sides to create that landscape buffer. So entrance points. Off of North Lake Boulevard, on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, there are three entrance points. The one in the middle, the main street, is a full uh, intersection where you'll have a east or north-south, excuse me, a right-in, right-out, left-in, left-out, a full intersection. These two will be right-in and right-out only. So those are the entrances off of North Lake Boulevard. Off of Coconut, there are three major connection points and one minor connection point. The first one here and here, these are right in, right out only. This minor entrance point is to the back of the Publix facility, which by the way, there's a significant wall landscaping, which you will not see the loading area from the back. 
the, the loading areas here and the trucks back in and then they'll pull out this way to leave Avenida. And then here at the roundabout, this important primary street connects all the way to phase one. And that as you roll around what is Toll Brothers project uh, and then Cahob Manian's project, you'll see there's a connection and a stub road that ends. That road will now continue all the way around and create that connection point. So you'll be able to go around the roundabout, have ingress and egress. You also, second part of that road network, which you'll see when the townhomes come in, for bringing the townhomes right up to it. So it's really gonna be a pedestrian walk. The front of their townhomes will be right up here. And it'll create that nice streetscape. So intersection improvements, I heard a lot of comments about traffic this evening. First things first, we are not requesting any additional traffic than what's already been improved within Avenir. That is not a request that is in front of you this evening. However, there were questions about North Lake Boulevard. Now, of course, the, the project before was further east, but let me tell you what's happening on North Lake Boulevard, kind of where we are. The North Lake Boulevard is the widening process project, as you know, the first portion is already done. The second portion, which goes basically from this entrance point to the west, is well underway. The contract has now been let to Ranger, and, and that work is gonna start by the end of the year. That includes both phase one connection to, to coconut and phase two connections to the town center. So all those connection points are being made. At North Lake Boulevard and Avenir Drive, this is an important question, is there gonna be a signal? We recently had a traffic study done and that it now meets the warrants. We're starting the permitting process. We hope to have that installed sometime in 2023. On North Lake Boulevard and coconut, this intersection here, always a question about what's happening there. The plans are underway. The con there is a contractor under contract and the construction of the intern, uh, the construction of the first set of conditions is gonna be done by, uh, or start by the end of this year and we expect it to be completed in June of 2023. We have a very specific condition in your development or your staff, of course, is always looking out for the city. They put a very specific condition which requires either the North Lake or Avenir, excuse me, North Lake and Avenir, or North Lake and Cove kind of signals to be operational before we get a seal. That's also part of one of our contracts with one of the uh, tenants. Or sorry, take that back. It is not one of the uh, requirements with the tenants. The tenant requirement is that the road is constructed. So sidewalks, pedestrian connections, an important part of the project. We have a significant amount of sidewalks. There is also multi-purpose trails, community greens, linear parks, public places, a lot of open space on this site. So first let's go through the sidewalk connection. The 12 foot sidewalk connections on the screen in front of you in the reddish brown color. Those are all 12 foot paths, kind of a multimodal avenue connection point tying off both on the east side to the Spine Road and to the west side to Coconut Boulevard. So everyone will have access via bike, via pedestrian, via uh, golf cart to the, Avenir, uh, to the Avenir Town Center. The next set of sidewalks, as you get in that hierarchy, there's those eight foot sidewalks without it, through Avenir. The identified in pink are the eight foot sidewalks. Again, making the connection all the way to North Lake Boulevard and working our way down here on the secondary street on the east side. We don't have names yet, so it's the street closest to tolls, what we call it, but uh, it's the secondary street on the right-hand side of the screen. Then there is the connection and the requirement of the five-foot sidewalks, which are through the secondary streets by these parking areas. They create this collector area. You walk from your car to the five-foot sidewalk, then you make your way into the retail, residential, or commercial area. So this is a sidewalk network. So lots and lots of connections. I know all of you have been to standard shopping centers before. This is not a standard shopping center. Take a look at those sidewalk connections, the trees, the landscaping, everything incorporated. The next slide is probably is one of the most important connections that we've been working on for many, many months, actually years, uh, and how to connect the townhomes and also how to break up the sea of pavement within the site. So the center identified in, in, in red on the screen is an area we're calling Paseos. It's changed its name over the years, but it's now called the Paseos. And it's really a walkway to connect the townhomes to the north, the office to the, re the, office to the retail, and kind of create a nice break in that sea of landscaping by allowing people to walk and have a nice comfortable spot for a connection point. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So this Paseos uh, uh, identified here in red 
when you pull into the center, you're probably going to come in this way, or you may, if you're coming off a of North Lake, you may come in off of this entrance point. That road does not go through. It wasn't intended. It wasn't a design, design criteria to make that go through. It said, hey, let's make it more landscape, hardscape, and walkable. So I, in the screen below, this is looking north toward the center. On the left-hand side, you can kind of see the peak of the tower of the of the um, uh, Publix building here. And these are the, the lights, the landscape. You get a feel what the landscaping is. As you know, these are artist renderings are close. And then you'll, and then, uh, and then as uh, Vice Mayor Lit, you'll also have to notice where the uh, electric chargers are here in the bottom left-hand side of the screen. But as you walk, as you look and you walk to the north, you'll see the use of hardscape and pavers and different colors and different trees. The idea was to create shade and to create a break between those large parking lots to allow for the connection because parking is required. You do need to have parking in these areas. So this is another view as you move a little further north, you've walked up that Paseos a little bit and the idea of this is to give you a flair of what the architecture looks like too. This is a transitional style of architecture, but you've moved up to this area. So you're about halfway through the center. Now you want to take a look and see what you're seeing. So on the left-hand side, it's building number three. On the right-hand side, there's no building shown, but in the future, in phase two, there will be a building there. But the idea was, a, the, uh, the design concept was to create the space that could be used and actively used. Uh, people in our office call, call this a plinth. I just call it a raised stand uh, for people to place your Christmas tree, to have outdoor music, to have the soul guitar guy. Here you'll notice a restaurant in the corner, the transitional style of architecture with the roof line um, and also the spandro. And then you'll notice kind of how the outdoor eating works and the general landscaping in the area in the form of transitional architecture. Again, on the right-hand side, in the future, there will be buildings. Uh, today, there are, as proposed today, there are not any buildings proposed to be constructed today. So that's a look at the kind of that common center space. And then going a little further down on the Paseos, um, actually you're looking back in, the, in this case, but this gives you a view of what that's gonna look like. It's not gonna be that green in the future, ladies and gentlemen. There will be, there will be, land, there will be parking lots on both sides when phase two comes in. Um, but so this is future parking and future parking. In fact, the parking does come up right to that curb line. So that's the reason why you need that break and to create this walkable area. Um, there is also significant community green on the north side. This has gone through redesign after redesign after redesign, trying to figure out what this is going to be. When we finally locked down on the townhomes, you know, we got a lot of comments. Initially, this design, we had it much more interactive. We had paths going through. We had all kinds of stuff going there. But ultimately, the idea of this green is to create a separation between the commercial to the south, the residential to the north, to allow a space that can just be used for playing and doing different things. And I, I always think of the community called Paseos in, in, in another municipality we won't mention, but it, but it has this wide Paseos area. And I think that's really kind of design concept for this. Uh, restaurants, lots of restaurants with outdoor eatings. Uh, there are 21 potential outdoor eating locations identified on the blue, by the blue dots. I'm not going to show you, to go through each one, but there are a lot of outdoor dining opportunities. Oops, sorry. So now I'm just going to give you a quick flare of the buildings, and then after that, I'm going to do two or three more slides, and I'll be done. So I'm going to walk you through a few views. We have lots of views. I'm not going to do that to you. I'm going to do three views. View number one is as you pull into the community off of North Lake Road. Boulevard. So here, I'm going, now I'm going westbound on North Lake. I've come to the main entrance or the premier street, and I'm turning into the community, or turning into the commercial town center. You'll see, first thing, a little bit of signage here on the right-hand side. You'll notice the landscaping theme. This is consistent with the rest of the landscaping theme that you see on, on in front of Avenir. The differential here, which I will request, or which you'll hear about in a waiver, is the buffer today is 90 feet, but in front of commercial, that buffer drops down to 50 feet. And it's similar again to what you have at Alton, but here as you pull in, you can get a flare of what the building on the left-hand side is and just a good architectural design. So view number 13, I'm just gonna drive you down the road a little bit more looking to the north right here. So this is a view of the road looking to the north. 
first thing you'll notice, there's parking in the background. You can't see it. It's part of design guidelines. We're required to provide a 50-foot separation. In that 50-foot separation, we've created these design elements. Of course, there'll be a good portion of Oolite, as there always is at Avenir. And then the same thing on both sides of the road. Uh, and these have created this nice little space, significant amount of landscaping. In this area, there is an on-street parking. As you look further down the road, where the buildings start coming into play, there is on-street uh, parking. Uh, view 14 um, here, looking at the first building on the left-hand side. The first view you're going to see kind of looking down on that building. This is the first site um, uh, of that building. Here we're proposing art in public places, and yes, Council Member Woods, we will be coming back in front of the AIPP and doing a significant amount of art in public places on this project. But this will give you an idea of what the design is. We will have uh, outdoor seating areas, this nice little open area. And this is a very small space, but well used with the idea of attracting people to the outdoor restaurant spaces. View number three kind of shows the bigger area of, of, of gathering space. There's, there's, this, there's this one, and then there's this one. I'm only going to show you the one on the left. So this is a restaurant space here. Immediately to the north is this large open space. And it's open space on purpose to create areas for people to play and gather. And on the other side, immediately on the other side, we have the exact same space, but we have a huge tree right in the middle. So just kind of a different look on both sides. This is, uh, is a synthetic play area. Here you'll notice this wall and then the water scuffers designed on purpose to create this space separate away from the vehicles and the parking area. So basically it becomes this nice water wall and creates that separation. So this becomes its own kind of special space, but still coming into the main road. You'll notice here on the roadway, this is the width of the roads. Here are the on-street parking. And then from a design standpoint, the transitional architectural design, which, uh, which was approved by your planning and zoning board, and, uh, and they, they quite liked it. View number seven, give you another view of uh, right here on the left-hand side of what building number two is going to look like. This is building number two. Um, again, architectural style, clean, transitional. Here you'll notice bike racks. These are pretty cool bike racks. These are actually the ones that are going to be part of the design. And then the bamboo, and then the bollards kind of creating the streetscape. So on to the PCD entry feature, uh, just a few more to go. PCD entry feature at the corner of North Lake and Coconut. Um, you can see it on the screen in front of you. It's a little bit different design than the other one, but very similar in characteristics. Uh, here you'll see the, how it sits in on both sides. You'll notice the, the, uh, the way that it fits with the, with the uh, tower out with the element on the top, and you can see the streets. Let me blow up in more detail. This is the proposal. Pretty significant feature, a little bit smaller than the other one, very significant feature. There is one change from this one to the other one. We learned a really valuable lesson about the roof, and this one will be aged bronze in a metal roof. But the cladding will be the same, the design characteristics will be the same, significant amount of water, a fire bowl, the width is 33 feet. This is a very significant monument at the, on both sides of that entrance point. Signage program. Um, the signage program itself, there are, this is a commercial retail office center, so there's a significant amount of signage involved in these type of centers. I'm not going to walk you through the whole thing, but I, I forgot to mention during the design discussion that we've kind, of ca we've kind of captured this palm theme. You'll see this kind of palm thing here, palm theme here on the Oolite. Those palms are, that, that design, those metal designs are actually used on some of the buildings also. So there's these large metal areas that show those designs. But this is the a signage program, um, a very clean and crisp signage program throughout the project, including directional signs, drive-through directional signs, building directories, and all types of things. But there'll be oolite stone columns with pins for the, um, for the word Avenir, and then you'll see the, pan the panel sign. Waivers. Um, we do have a couple waivers. There's about eight waivers. And I just want to get my notes out real quick here. So the waivers, first one is a waiver of minimum block length. That waiver, the requirements uh, actually require you to have a minimum width of blocks. We're actually less than what's required, and that's just because of the nature of how the project ended up getting designed because of the entrance points. 
so the roads are required to be 200 feet well we're not we don't have 250 feet of separation in some areas so a waiver that is supported by your staff the next one um, is the minimum building setback along North Lake Boulevard there's a 50 foot setback required to the building well the authors of the design standards um, didn't really think that through all the way because we're already providing a 50 foot PCD buffer so design so we have that initial 50 feet and then the design standards say you have to have another 50 feet and that really wasn't the intent the intent was to bring those buildings closer to North Lake Boulevard, but still have that significant buffer away from, uh, away from North Lake. The third one is a parking lot separation on the secondary street. Three and four go together, and pedestrian seating on the secondary street. That, that is the area in front of Publix, in front of a grocery store. Um, it didn't make sense. As you know, Publix has angled parking all the way in their parking lot. Also, there's a significant amount of traffic in those areas. So in those areas, just in that area, we're requesting a waiver to those two requirements. And, those, and that waiver is offset by the fact that on the north side, there's over 15 feet of sidewalk and landscaping when compared to that additional, what would have been a five foot sidewalk on the south side. Um, the fifth waiver is for ground floor opening on the secondary streets. There are requirements on the amount of uh, glass required um, we are requesting on two buildings that that be reduced. One is Publix and the second one is, is a pharmacy to be consistent with those type of stores. Um, the, third, the next set of waivers are, land, are your land development regulation waivers. It has to do with wall signs, building directory signs, and perimeter wall and entry feature. Let me walk you through the, the wall sign one first. Um, so the wall sign, so the, the, the way the code works it doesn't allow for a second sign on a building. So if you have a front and a back, if you're not on a major roadway. Well, as you saw in our plan, the majority of those buildings aren't on a major roadway. So we're requesting to have a, a sign, ability to have a sign on the front and the ability to have a sign on the back if there's an entrance point. Um, the next one is the building directory sign. The way the code works, again, defaulted to code, code says those directory signs have to be within 25 feet of a building. Works perfectly when we're talking about one office building, but when you have a center, you want to have director signs spread throughout the entire center. And consistent, we see Legacy Place, Albany, all the centers have, have that type of design. And then finally, the third one is the perimeter wall or entry feature. And the Avenir entry features that are at the corner of North Lake and Coconut, we have the word Avenir on all four sides up top. The code only allows you to have it on two sides. And the purpose of that well, is if you're doing these big monument signs on the side, you don't want to have them all over the place. But we think that the word Avenir on top of those, uh, on top of those structures is very classic and a nice design. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation and uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. We have the whole team assembled. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate it. Do we have a staff presentation this evening? I think the applicant covered everything. Uh, staff has had the opportunity during our agenda reviews to present the project. We do recommend approval. Uh, we appreciate the applicant working with us to get to this point, and we, uh, we recommend approval of this project. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I don't have any comment cards, so I'll be closing this hearing. May I get a, second, a motion and a second to approve, please? I'll make a motion to approve. Rochelle. Second. Okay, thank you both so much. So, Rochelle, you passed, uh, you um, made the motion. If you want to bring it back for discussion and kick it off, please. Sure. Um, Ken, as far as the traffic lights go, just for clarity, the Avenir North Lake one, that one we've qualified for, so we're starting the process for that. The main street going in, what did you call the main street? The Premier, Premier, Premier Street. Premier, Premier street. That's going to be a dual in and out from all directions. That's not just a right in, right out, right? Correct. The status of what does that traffic light depend on? It, depend, it depends on trips. And since there's no trips there today, it's not warranted. But, but we will continue to monitor that as, a, as part of the project. I, but that will definitely go in after the Avenir and North Lake one, because at least that will slow traffic or stop it for a period of time so people can get in and out Correct. the other one. 
correct, there'll be that separation for, because of the traffic light both at Avenir and also at North Lake. All right, so there'll be three traffic lights from that sec from Avenir Drive, the Premier Street, and then Coconut, ultimately. Ultimately, well, yes, ultimately but, the, but the two are, are coming within the next year. Um, well, I'm sorry, maybe I'll be clear, the revision, the, the changes to North Lake and Coconut, that will be one, and that, that's not a new light, it's just being modeled on, and worked. Right. And then the Avenir Drive will be a new one. The street parking, is it on both sides of the road where it exists or one side? Uh, on street parking will be on both sides of the road. How wide is that? Ask that question. It's either eight or nine feet. If you give me one second, I'll, I'll get the right. It's nine. There you go. Nine by 23. Nine, nine, nine by 23. Nine by 23. Okay. So that leaves enough room in the middle to maneuver oh, yeah, on I both so, sides? I understand. I, I didn't understand. I, I think I understand. Ma'am. So, yes, I mean, the idea is to create a smaller street section to have it slower. I mean, that's really designed. So think about, you know, historic streets or like, you know, my office corner, Clematis and Rosemary. And that's really the design intent of these type of, of this type of center. Um, and that's really kind of the, the design here to slow it down by having those narrower streets. Now, on Clematis, there are no curbs. But it's only on the Premier Street. Yeah, I'm sorry. Only, only on, it's only, only on Only on the main street. No, only on the main street going up and down. The other streets on the right-hand side. They all have regular parking, not street parking. Okay. Now, they're still on street parking, but the Vice Mayor to clarify, the, the yeah. primary street that Ken mentioned that was the closest to Toll Brothers, the one on the far east, also has on-street parking as well. Okay, the one all the way on the Every, Everywhere else, it's it's just, um, so right where it says View 14. Right. There in the middle, going north, that primary street has on-street parking, and then um, there's where Ken has his cursor is on-street parking as well. On Clematis, there's no sidewalks, and you're kind of in the gutter as you're pulling in, and there's metal poles. These are regular curbed for, for old people like us who do know how to parallel park, they do have sidewalks. You mean you don't push Carbs. a button and, and park? Um, well, yeah, my no. car does not do it for me. <laughs> they this are is, this is give okay. you a good, I'm sorry, give you a good view of what it looks like. I hope that helps. The charging stations, just to, they're 36, they're 18 doubles or 36 doubles? I, I, well, you don't think what I heard before, I had to double check that. <laughs> um, so, you knew it was coming. Yeah, so, so. There, were, there, are, there are a total of 36 places to plug your car, car into. Yeah, that's the first phase, there are 12, which is, and then in the second phase, there are 24. Okay. No, that's, that's great. It's, 18, it's, I'm sorry, 12, I'm sorry, total 36, my math wasn't right, 12, and then there were 18 in the second phase. It's, it's exciting. It's taken a long time to get here, but it's really a beautiful uh, project. It's going to be a beautiful addition. Um, the landscaping, the planning, uh, I know you worked really hard with staff. Thank you to staff for keeping at it to, to end up with this. Do we know who? Oh, I know. The hotel is, which phase is the hotel? It'll be in the second phase. That's it's a 90-room hotel. There's not a flag or a there's not a flag yet. We don't have a flag. Do we have a flag on the pharmacy yet either? No. Not, not, not that you are at liberty to disclose. Okay. So I, I think you can public, guess it's probably one of two. One of two. <laughs> yes. I just fig you figured as, as, right. as much. Okay. Great. No. Thank you. Good, good questions. Thank you, Rochelle. Marcy. Thank you. Um, I don't have much. It was a very thorough presentation. Um, I appreciate uh, the project, I guess practice makes perfect. Um, I know you've been at it for a very long time. So um, with that said, I really like the palm design on the signs and throughout the um, project that uh, actually makes it, spe you know, creates some special places and um, it really goes well with the uh, theme of South Florida. Um, I so appreciate the fact that our code allows for waivers because waivers, unlike variances, uh, which are required to be self, you know, you can't have a meet a variance because it's self-imposed or 
um, a waiver, you can just ask. Um, and if you have exemplary criteria, it, it in this case, for example, is, is a perfect reason because not all sites are um, the same. So those waivers make things uh, work better. So I appreciate that you um, asked for them and they make sense. So with all that said, I'm in favor of the project and look forward to seeing it constructed. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you. Mark? You guys have enough oolite stone for all of this stuff that you guys built? <laughs> I, I, I think you have to. I was wondering that too. Oh, that's crazy. Um, no, it, it looks great. Um, everything looks uh, what we were kind of hoping for. I know that we can't really predict the future of retail. I know we've had a lot of conversations about this, but uh, I think it's, it, well, obviously, uh, we're very happy with the way it looks. A couple questions, and I just was kind of thinking about it as I was, again, just watching Ken's presentation. When we talk about the golf carts, we've had this conversation about just generally speaking, people driving golf carts in communities. I know this is really a heavy golf cart community, we hope. So people that live within the community will take their golf carts everywhere instead of getting in their cars. Um, golf carts, sometimes people drive a little bit silly with them. They think that they own the roads, which is funny, but potentially a risk. So when you look at the 12 foot sidewalks, so the 12 foot multi-purpose sidewalks uh, that is to encourage the golf carts to come into the community itself. They are pretty much in the perimeter. Where is the golf cart parking and how do they get there? Are they going to have to drive through a regular car parking lot area to get to golf cart parking? And is there a potential risk that the golf cart drivers are pretending they're in cars and they're not? Sure. Councilman Marciano, for the record, Brett Leone. Um, Planning and zoning. To answer the question, there's there's a few golf cart parking lots within the town center and strategically located to avoid those conflicts that you had mentioned. So, um, the main parking field for golf carts is located right here, adjacent to the Paseo, about the central portion of it. There's a dedicated, um, as you mentioned, a 12 foot multi-use path that runs along this way, that will connect to the proposed and pretty much already constructed multi-use path on the east side of Coconut Boulevard. Um, there's another parking field as well in the um, northeast corner that is accessible via the 12-foot multi-use path that's on the south side of the uh, primary street as well. Will there be enough signage to make sure that golf carts don't start whipping through the golf through the parking lots? Yes, within the master signage program, there's wayfinding signs specifically to direct golf carts to those golf cart parking areas. Okay. I guess as we move forward, I just like want to make sure that we don't run the risk of of people getting a little bit loose on their golf carts, whipping through the parking lots, because I, I, you know, you just, especially in the evening, coming home from a restaurant, people jump in their golf cart. Yeah, you just don't want to see any uh, any mixture of golf carts with regular cars. Uh, you know, just just to touch on that as well, we did work with the applicant and our our police department to to work on the location of these golf carts to kind of avoid those conflicts and some of the issues that you had raised. Yeah, because cars always win. Yeah. I appreciate that. I, I, just, I didn't think about it during the agenda review. Uh, is, have you already started leasing space? Okay. And so the, 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 the suggested timeline of the proposed publics is when? I think I have to answer this question very carefully because I know our clients are in the room. The answer is right now. Uh, they, they want to move forward very quickly, and there's a lot of pressure on their planning team to get this done. So building one will be starting construction along with probably, all that? Probably, re real reality is we're probably six, six, probably three to four months through a building permit process after this, a plat approval, and then construction, the construction will probably, it'll probably be end of 2020. Do we go first quarter, or do we go end of 2023? And their construction timeline is about 8 to 11 months. So you're looking at the end of 23 before the Publix, and will all the other buildings kind of start construction and go at the same time, or you really focus on getting building one? The, the building permits, the initial building permit segment, the buildings that are done and designed and ready to be submitted, uh, as soon as we get through here tonight, if we get through, our buildings one, two, three, and uh, five are already designed and con uh, already ready to be submitted. The other ones are under heated design right now. So. The intent is to build the majority of the project at one time. I can't promise you know, how the world's going to turn six months from now, but what I can tell you is that those buildings are under, under design and 
the, those four buildings I just mentioned, or five buildings, are are ready with construction documents. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mark Carl. And how big is this in, in as opposed to the size of Alton? So Alton is two hundred and is it sixty thousand square feet with with I think that's not the right word, don't I? I don't. It's hard to remember. Forty About acres. Eight, Forty acres of land. Fifty-one acres of land. Additional hundred twenty thousand square feet of of office on this one that is not in Alton. That uh, I do know. I'm not going to say much. I mean, it's amazing projects. We have great applicants, people who care. Thank you for showing up on these meetings. And we have a staff that care, and we have council that care. Everybody cares. So, but the product's ridiculous. And the good thing about this is it's a traffic attractor. So it's going to, um, even when Amateur gets built it, with that many restaurants, people aren't going to have a big reason to go east of the B line. Um, so it really services the area nicely. I can't wait, you know, until it gets going. We can get out there and, you know, what can I say? I, I, I like being a part of this and, and uh, watching you guys do your stuff. Natalie, your team is awesome, you know. Um, I could make some jokes on that and how you beat people up, but I won't. But um, I just appreciate all the hard, hard work and can't wait to see it come up. Thank you. If I may, I, re I really want to give a lot of credit to Brett Leone. He worked very hard, and Joanne Scaria and Peter Hoffines worked very hard on yeah, this Yeah, it's project. important. This is a big deal. So, Thank you, Carl. So once again, my council team up here makes my job very easy. I don't have anything more to add. We're looking forward to everything, and it's been a pleasure to watch this back since my time on zoning. And Brett, you've done a beautiful job. I love how many floors you bring. You're ready for anything, uh, and Natalie and Joanne and Peter and all of our zoning staff and all of our staff staff, because this has been a collaborative effort with the builders. So thank you also to Rosa Dana Manny and to uh, Tanya now as well for, for coming along and working with our, our staff, because I know, like Carl said, we all do care so much. So it is my pleasure to close this hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve? Oh, you did. Oh, we did that? Sorry, that was a long night. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> All opposed? None? Uh, none opposed, so we have a motion and it passes. The vote is unanimous, thank you. We have no resolutions on the agenda this evening, so next we have items for council action, discussion, or items of interest. Does anyone have an item? Rochelle. I do, sorry guys, I'll be really quick. This is the, the time of, of year when I usually come before you and ask for support for the Homeless Coalition's Lewis Center Luncheon. We've been supporting them with a table uh, every fall at the luncheon. Um, according to the city manager, we do have the funding to do it, if you all agree. A table, $1,750, seats 10. Um, <laughs> The chiefs back there. This year we're honoring the first responders who support the homeless. We have several people on our force that are supporting others in the county doing that work. Might be nice if they could have time off at lunch to maybe have, have them occupy some of the seats instead of just us. Uh, so it's seventeen fifty for for the table and it goes to support the Lewis Center which houses 20, 200 homeless men and women uh, and for the 99,000 meals that they get served every year. So so I was just a need to agree to whether um, Ron can. Yeah. Max, Ron, would just go ahead and we, we verbally agree to, to this. Verbally, we just have the to Lewis verbally luncheon. agree to allow you to write the check for the Lewis Not Center luncheon. table for the luncheon for the Homeless Coalition. Okay. Yes. Okay, is that the consensus of our council? I Maybe see. talk to the, the chief about yep. our, um, our uh, officers we lost that it. There is. Su support the, the county task force maybe being able to go if we have a few since we're honoring the, the first responders that support the homeless. So. All, All right. right, great, thank well, you. That's We're in agreement. Thank you, Rochelle. Anyone else? Yeah, I got something. All right, and well. I never have anything. But I'm going to tell you what, I went out there and I visited the, the par three that's going in. And we did a full tour of every hole. And normally on the items for council discussion, I don't say anything. But Cassie out there and Ron, who was the, who was the engineer that rode with us on the, on the uh, what was his name? Uh, Bert. 
anyway, go look the, the yeah, this with Casey, yeah, and take a tour. It's, it's almost all paved. Um, Mark, you don't have to get your feet wet. And it's just, I mean, the size of the putting green, the building, uh, it's going to be the sports bar, the TV. We all know there's nine bays on top, nine bays on the bottom. But, I mean, for us golfers, you just, I was driving around just looking at each hole, just going, just saying, wow. And, Ron, I think it's already up for an award. Um, it's going to be put in motion for an award or something. Anyway, so it's already on people's radar that are just watching us do what the city does. So I wanted to bring that up. Go check it out. I'm going to start I'm my lessons again soon because I'm coming back in November. I already claimed my seat at the bar. I'll let you know which one it is. Oh, hey, hey. Wait. One. Okay. I'm going to have to get out there. Yeah, you got to go. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you, Carl. No, that's great. Thank you, Carl. Um, do we have a city attorney's report? No, ma'am. All right. If there's no other business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.